Good morning and welcome to CBIA's 2021 Connecticut Tax Conference. My name is Eric Getty and I'm the Vice President of Public Policy for CBIA. It's good to be with you all again, even if just virtually, after being unable to hold last year's conference. Given all that has changed in the world over the last year, there are many tax implications to talk about. Not to mention, we just mostly concluded a legislative session where the state, for the most part, adopted a new budget and tax package. That $46.4 billion two-year tax and spending plan was adopted on the final day of the session with strong bipartisan support. The budget avoids broad-based tax hikes and increases spending by 2.6% in fiscal year 2022 and 3.9% in the following year, with major investments in municipal aid, education, nonprofit providers, and workforce development. Lawmakers also left the state's record $3.5 billion rainy day fund untouched, leveraging $1.75 billion in federal COVID-19 relief funds while depositing surplus dollars from the current year in the under, underfunded state employee pension system. Generally speaking, CBIA was very supportive of this budget for a number of reasons, not the least of which being its avoidance of major tax hikes, despite the strong push from progressive lawmakers for more than $1 billion in tax increases targeted largely at Connecticut businesses and job creators. Connecticut will finish this fiscal year with a $500 million surplus, a record rainy day fund, and billions in federal relief dollars. We're grateful that so many policymakers recognize that and resisted proposals that would undermine our economic recovery. Fortunately, Governor Ned Lamont, Republican lawmakers, and the legislature's new moderate blue dog caucus stood with CVIA and its allies to hold the line against tax hikes. We're also grateful for the support of the 55 state legislators, both Democrat and Republican, who signed CBIA's Rebuilding Connecticut Policy Pledge, which featured a series of recommendations. Because of our advocacy efforts throughout the session, you aren't gonna be hearing today about some very real proposals that we fought against, including a so-called consumption tax that was really just an income tax surcharge, a digital ad tax that would have increased the cost of advertising for small businesses, an increase in the capital gains tax, making the 10% temporary corporate surcharge tax a permanent tax, a $50 million health insurance assessment tax that would have raised health premiums, and a new payroll tax. In overall terms, this was largely a positive legislative session, one that sets the course for rebuilding the state's economy and getting people back to work. From the budget to significant targeted invest investments in our cities, workforce development and childcare to historic unemployment reforms. And just a note on those unemployment reforms, another major priority for CBIA this year, those long overdue reforms will reduce unemployment taxes for 73% of Connecticut businesses, while saving the unemployment fund $84 million annually and generating 130 million in new annual revenues. That legislation, which passed both the House and Senate with unanimous support, will help reduce the likelihood the state will need to again borrow from the federal government during the next economic downturn to pay out unemployment claims. The reforms will help drive the state's post-pandemic economic recovery, easing financial uncertainty and preventing future tax hikes and assessment on employers to cover fund shortfalls and strengthening our workforce. There are numerous reasons to be optimistic about the state's future based on the actions the legislature and the Lamont administration took over the last five plus months in the broad range of favorable economic news that is shifting the wind to our backs. We are fortunate today to have Robert Osman from PwC and Shipman and Goodwin attorney Louis Schatz, who will provide a full breakdown of all the tax policy changes that came out of that session. And then later this morning, you will hear from Pullman and Comley's Greg Servididio and KPMG's Joseph Hanley, who will provide guidance on how to avoid pitfalls when it comes to your property taxes. However, first up today, it is my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, someone who has worn many hats when it comes to Connecticut politics, including as a state representative, as Danbury's longest serving mayor, and now as the Commissioner of Revenue Services. Please welcome Commissioner Mark Bowden. Commissioner, good morning. Good morning, Eric, and um, thanks for having me today. I'm, I'm excited, even if it's on Zoom. Um, it's uh, been an interesting 
uh, eight months for me personally, professionally, but the fact that I can still connect up with CBIA and uh, the people that work so very, very hard uh, each and every day is, is really an honor. So uh, for those of you who don't know me out there, my name is Mark Bouton. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of my background before I was uh, uh Appointed as commissioner of DRS, I was the mayor of the city of Danbury for 19 and a half years. Before that, I served in the state legislature. Before that, I owned a small business. Before that, I taught high school. So I've kind of been around the mill a little bit and um, have had an honor of, of being a public servant for almost uh, 40 years. Um, we have a lot of uh, priorities at the Department of Revenue Services, and I'm going to talk about those this morning and share a little bit with you about where I think we're going and what we're doing, but I do want to um, thank you for having this event and certainly scope out for you what I think the tax landscape has been um, given uh, the actions of the legislature. Uh, they're in session today, by the way, and tomorrow. Uh, I think we'll be able to do that. And then at the end, we'll be able to take some uh, uh, questions if you have any questions or concerns or thoughts that you might want to share. Um, so real quick, um, as I mentioned, uh, I, I was the mayor of the city of Danbury for many years. I, I was proud to lead that community. Uh, I, that community still today has one of the lowest effective property tax rates in the state, has the lowest sewer and water rates in the state of Connecticut. In addition to that, um, has one of the fastest growing economies in the state, continues to grow even throughout the COVID uh, crisis, is one of the safest cities in Connecticut, if not the safest city in Connecticut. Uh, and it's been a job creator uh, over these many, many years, and certainly the 20 years that I was there. So uh, it was an honor to do that. And um, I love my job. I love getting up every morning, and going to work. Um, you know, you do have a two year term there, so it's work. Uh, you can't re ever really uh, let your guard down. I don't think I've taken a vacation in about 15 years, but um, it was really a labor of love. And uh, it was tough for me to, to leave. Uh, but, uh, you know, this was an opportunity that I thought would be good for myself professionally and push myself out of my comfort zone. Um, and I think it's proven that out. You know, the funny, funny thing I noticed is that for the first four months or so after I, when I would leave DRS at night, I had like the biggest headache ever. And that told me that I was probably using a different set of muscles than what I had as mayor, right? Mayor, I had it down. I could pretty much run the entire city by uh, my cell phone and, and get things done all over the place. But definitely uh, different, even though I had been a legislator and understood state government a little bit better. So how did I get here? Well, um, Governor Lamont and I, as you know, I ran for governor a, a couple of times. And Governor Lamont and I, although we're on different teams, uh, always had a mutual respect for each other. And we became very friendly over the last 15 years. And so you don't do that. Uh, you, you can't help but become friendly crossing the campaign trail. And he would speak somewhere. And then five minutes later, I would go in and speak. And then um, you know, I would speak and he would speak. And so, you know, over that period of time, we always maintained a cordial relationship and frankly got to be friends and stayed in touch. And um, he asked that I come aboard last fall. Initially, I, I said, I'm not, I'm not ready to do that, but I appreciate the thought. And, um, you know, he called a couple more times and then I started thinking about it. And in November, I decided that, you know, I, I wasn't going to run again, that it was time for me to move on. Um, my numbers were strong. I wanted to leave as I always tell everybody, I wanted to leave while everybody was still clapping. I didn't want to leave the stage while I was being booed. And so um, I thought it would be a really good time that I got the city positioned where I thought it needed to be positioned to tackle some of the challenges and would be a chance to, for me to move on. So I was going to announce that I wasn't running. Governor Lamont called out of the blue. He said, I'm going to ask you one more time. I need you to do this. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll come up and talk to you. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And after over a period of a couple of months, I got comfortable with the idea and eventually came on board on December 18th of 2020. Um, so my priorities in the agency really have been to uh, modernize. Uh, we already were in the middle of a modernization program called CTAX, uh, was to look at our current agency initiatives uh, to help Im uh, imprint the state tax landscape. And one of the discussions I had with the governor, and probably the only discussion that I thought was critical, is I said, look, I said, I firmly believe that we don't need new taxes. We need new taxpayers. We need a better business environment. We, we need a welcoming environment here in Connecticut, but we do not need new taxes. So I said, governor, with all due respect, if your agenda is to just raise taxes, um, just because I'm not, I'm not interested in doing that. 
And he said, Mark, I agree with you. He said, we don't need new taxes. We need more taxpayers. And um, I'm going to free you up to do what you need to do uh, in your one piece of the uh, large uh, state pie, if you will. And uh, I'm not going to micromanage you. You can do your own hiring. You can set course to the agency any way you see fit. Um, and uh, I trust you. And I know that um, you'll do what's best for Connecticut. So that was refreshing to hear. And, and he's been a man true to his word. He does not, you know, we talk often. We are fr friends uh, straight up, but um, he never, I don't think he's ever sat there and said, you have to do something that I was adamantly, vehemently opposed to. Uh, and it's a credit to him as a leader. And as somebody who has been a leader, it's hard. Uh, sometimes I like to take your hands off and just let the people you put in positions to do the job you, you hire them to do. Um, but he's been successful at doing that. And I think we as a state are better off uh, because of it. So what did I learn, you know, after being on board is that, well, first of all, DRS is a, it's a well-run agency. I mean, it's not broke and it doesn't necessarily need a wholesale revamping. We did do a reorg right when I uh, came in uh, with the help of John Biello, a great deputy, by the way, I was doing a fantastic job. It's been there many, many years. Um, but, you know, we shared a very common philosophy. And so uh, he said, listen, here's some of the things that I've been working on. And I said, well, here's some of the things I think we need to do. And he said, I think you're right. And so, you know, we made those things happen. And it's, an, it's a work in progress, if you will. What is amazing to me is the volume of work that goes through DRS. Really, we touch every single thing in state government. That doesn't mean we always have an impact or, or input on certain things, but we do uh, have our fingers on pretty much everything. And that to me was somewhat stunning. I, I wasn't aware of that and, and I knew of the agency, uh, but I didn't understand uh, how important it is obviously to uh, every other agency within state government. Um, we are staffed with tremendous uh, tax professionals. I'm sure many of you have, have, have interacted with them. We have worked very hard. Uh, I even uh, uh, have taken a firsthand look myself. I, I actually went down and, and, and manned the phone center one morning and answered calls from residents all over the state, uh, just as our, our, our call center does, because I wanted to understand a little bit about what our employees go through. And I'll be doing more of that kind of stuff um, throughout the year. Um, look, it, it's a great time right now to be at the state of Connecticut uh, in terms of working for government, to be at DRS, because we're doing well on our, our collections. Uh, we have uh, 40, over 44 taxes and fees that we are responsible for collecting, almost uh, $22 billion each year, and collections have been going very well. We're going to run a significant surplus this year, um, which is another conversation. We're not drawing down on our uh, fund balance, which is a good thing for us. Um, so it's, it's a time that we can use to reorganize, and this is what I talked to the governor about. This is a time when we can, we can, we can lower our footprint. Uh, in terms of the overall size and scope of state government, and he agrees with that. He understands we need to be leaner and tighter with what we do. Um, some of my priorities uh, while I've been working at DRS are to provide excellent customer service. Very important to me that we uh, do everything we can to let people know that, that they are the focus of our work, that we work for them, that they're not a bother to us, and that uh, we want to make sure that we can do everything we can to stimulate voluntary compliance. Now look, here's, here's a figure that I, which, which just blew me away. And I actually learned about this from my apartment complex of all things. The, the people that work uh, and do the leasing of, of the place that I live, I was down there one day and uh, I was paying my rent and I was just talking to them. I, I'm a talker kind of person, that's just me. And so I was talking to them and I said, uh, so how, you know, how's business? Are people coming in? Are they leasing? What's the story here? And they said, oh, you know, it's been good. They said, but you know, 50% of the people that come in our door cannot verify their income. In other words, they make enough money to live here, but they can't tell us where they got the money from. And frankly, they're working under the table. So I kind of, that stuck in my head even before I took this job. And I said, well, hi, that's amazing when you think about that. 50% of the people that walk in the door to rent an apartment can't verify their income. And she even told me, by the way, that a gentleman had just left, I just missed him, that had $45,000 of cash in his pocket and he wanted to lease an apartment and they wouldn't lease it to him because you know, they didn't know if he had robbed a bank or whatever. So I took that with me and, I, and I, when, when I went to DRS, the first thing I did is I looked up 
uh, some of the studies that had been done there and talked to, to people like John and some of the staff there. And I said, listen, this is what they're telling me at my apartment complex. That can't be right, right? I mean, that seems kind of bizarre. And I said, oh no, uh, we believe that about 45% of the businesses and people in the state of Connecticut do not pay their full tax liability. That means that 55% of the people who and businesses that are in Connecticut who pay their full liability are carrying the weight to the other 45%. So we call that the tax gap. Uh, I found um, that to be somewhat fascinating to me. And it, I said, that's gonna be a focus of our work. We are gonna work and do everything we can to close uh, this tax gap, to get people to participate in our government. Because remember, if you don't pay, you don't care what kind of services are delivered. You don't care about your community. You don't care about what's happening in your state because you're, you're not a stakeholder. You, you haven't bought into it. So it's critically important that we do everything we can to first get people to voluntarily comply. And then if that doesn't work, we're gonna to look towards enforcement actions or different kinds of ways to, to identify that 45%. One of the uh, important thing that we are looking at is creating a analytics unit. We call this the RAF, Revenue Auditing and Forecasting Unit. Literally, I want you to close your eyes and think about having five young people in flip-flops and tie-dye and long hair walking around DRS in a cubbyhole off to the corner. Their job is going to look at how do we generate more revenue by getting to that 45%? Who do we audit that will provide the greatest rate of return for our agency by looking at that to get to that 45%? And finally, What's the forecast in the future? We have a lot of big things happening in our state and our nation. What does that mean for taxes? And what does that mean for the future of funding government? You know, I'll give you a good example, right? A lot of people are buying electric cars. That's a, a thing right now. Um, well, that means that our, as people continue to absorb electric cars and as companies have announced that they're gonna go to full electric um, in terms of their, uh, the vehicles that they're producing, that means that our gas receipts are gonna drop there'll be less people that'll be paying their gas tax. That means that we'll take a hit there. Well, I need to know that now so I can inform the legislature and the governor that 10 years from now, we're gonna need a different plan. That we're gonna have to figure out a different way to, to restructure uh, our transportation uh, uh, funding. And those are the kinds of forecasting things that we do on an ad hoc basis right now, but it's definitely something that we need to get uh, ahead of. And finally, uh, this unit, the RAF, is going to utilize artificial intelligence and algorithms, again, to tell us where are we losing out on taxes? Where are people not paying? Where are people not paying their full liability? Why aren't we collecting our full liability? How do we, how do we access that? What are other states doing in terms of this? And we're not only going to be able to look internally within Connecticut, but this unit will be able to look externally to 33 other states. So we'll be able to, we'll know for example, if Massachusetts is seeing an impact, uh, is seeing an increase in their sales and use tax. We'll be able to see that because we'll be able to look at their raw data. And that'll tell us, oh, we need, we're, not, we're not seeing that same impact. We have a problem there. So um, I think uh, uh, we uh, have an opportunity here to really up our game, to close that tax gap. And if we do that, we don't need to talk about raising taxes. We just got to make sure we collect every nickel that is legally and lawfully owed to the taxpayers of the state of Connecticut. I will tell you that also part of that process of, of closing that tax gap and of, of being able to do a better job at collections is to modernize. So we want you online. We don't want you in line. We've even we've seen that a little bit over at the DMV where they, they put their licenses up online. And um, if you've done that, you know, it is kind of shocking. Uh, because, you know, DO, DMV has always been, everybody's always, uh, you know, made comments about that uh, organization, although it's staff with very hardworking people, but really, uh, it's, you know, that little piece has gone a long way in changing around the way people look at the DMV. Well, we, we look at it the same way. Right now, we're down to about 20% of our filers are still filing in paper. We're going to push that to 100% over the next five years or so. Um, we don't want any paper being exchanged. We don't want people mailing in returns. This year, for the first time, we didn't send out, you know, massive bulks of um, booklets that you fill out to do your taxes. It, it freaked people out. We got a lot of calls because um, we used to send them to libraries, to senior centers, to all over places, and people would, 
do it, you know, in, on paper and mail it in. And we said, look, we really, you know, we'll give them to you if you want and we'll mail one to you, but we're not just going to print them up and dump them all over the state. We want you to use our online uh, portal. Now we've had to work within, you know, a very difficult, like you, a very difficult uh, construct in terms of the pandemic. I know that all of your businesses have taken a hit. All of you out there have had to think differently. Some of you have worked from home. Some of you couldn't. Some of you have restaurants and you have businesses that rely on people coming into your workplace. Uh, it's been difficult for everybody. And so the governor is well aware of that. Um, it's something we talk about almost every, every day. Uh, we just had a conversation last night about uh, the challenge that we have in terms of getting people to come back to work. And we've got some thoughts on that. Um, but he's been, I think all in all, I give the governor an A on handling this pandemic. He has been thoughtful, he's been steady, he's been strong, and he's been willing to listen. He's listened to CBIA, he's listened to, to his department heads. Um, he's listened to out of the box thinkers like me where I come in and come up, I, you know, I, I'm one of those people that has 10 ideas, seven are wacky, but there's three real diamonds there. And so he's patient enough to, to weed through the seven that'll probably never work and get to those three uh, really good ideas that might help our state. Um, so it's been a tough time for all of us, but we at DRS have never closed. We had no interruption of essential services. Our call wait times never budged. Um, so the lesson for me out of that is, you know, we're productive wherever our people sit. That um, maybe, and this is something that um, we ought to uh, talk about, I think, in a much broader context over a couple of years, maybe we don't, besides reducing the footprint of, of, of how many employees we have within the state government, we might want to think about eventually reducing the footprint of our bricks and mortar. We know now that, for example, our enforcement people don't need to come into the office if they have a, a, a VN, you know, a, a virtual net, private network, a VPN. Um, they can literally leave their home and go right to their to the facility that they're doing enforcement work on. They can do work in their home office for um, uh, audits and things like that, um, that we can manage our folks in an appropriate manner. Um, and that's something that, that I think we can have a conversation about later on uh, and when we look back and debrief over what the pandemic has done to us. Um, as I mentioned to you, we're, we're, we're expanding our online filing. We're trying to reduce paper all over the place. We're, uh, in the process of rolling out our phase two of what we call CS tax, which is really a, a, a core service uh, software upgrade that has already been in process and the team is doing a great job on that. It's a big deal, by the way. It's $67 million to, to upgrade our uh, software uh, core program. Um, and our launching is, is happening in September uh, for phase two. So we're excited about that. We're also operating and managing a Back to Work Connecticut initiative. Um, maybe some of you have heard about this, but we are paying $1,000 for anybody that goes, comes off the unemployment rolls, goes back to work and stays employed for eight weeks, eight consecutive weeks. Right now we have over 2,000 people that have signed up for this program, uh, but it's something that, you know, if you're a restaurateur, you can bundle your own bonus, as well as a state bonus, as long as they sign up and get a number and it's limited to the first 10,000 people. So we're gonna give away $10 million for people to go back to work because we know that people out there are hurting. Now, some of you will mention the $300, what they call the true up, which is the, the, the bonus that President Trump put in that was continued by President Biden as being a disincentive. Well, the, there's two things that are happening in Connecticut I think you should be aware of. One is that the true up ends in September per federal law. And two, we are requiring now people to go and look for jobs. They no longer can come in and just, you know, or just mail their paperwork and get a check. They have to prove to us that each week they've actually been out looking for a job if they want a check. So we're, we're trying to disincentivize people from not working. We think it's important people go back to work, obviously for our economy, but also I think for people's mental health. Um, let me talk for a second about our, um, 2021 uh, session. Uh, it has been a lot of stuff has gone on there. And just I'm just gonna run down a couple of the highlights that you, you may not even be aware of. Um, first of all, we're gonna be launching a tax amnesty program this year. We think that'll provide about a $50 million lift to the state budget. 
That runs from November 1st to January 31st. We'll be waiving penalties and reducing interest by 75%. Uh, second of all, uh, we're working on something called a tax incident study. It's something that's important to me because I think we need to know where our taxes are, who they're hitting, why they're hitting certain segments of our population, and do we need to make adjustments versus having people just out there making broad generalized statements about, well, we know that, you know, uh, the rich don't pay their fair share, or as other people say, the rich do pay their fair share. Well, we need to really have data in front of us that shows what are those numbers, and it hasn't been done probably in 15 years. So it's important for us to do that. Um, maybe some of you are aware of this. This is a funny one to me, but it's still, it's important because when I was a mayor, I used to flip out about this. But you know those little alcohol bottles you see all over the place? We call those nip bottles. And people throw them out the window. They, they go to the liquor store. They, they get a nip. They drink, and they, they just throw it on the ground. And I know in Danbury, they were all over the place. And I know I've talked to every other mayor in the state. They were all over the place. In fact, there are 85 million nip bottles sold a year in the state of Connecticut. So we did add a nickel onto that, not as a return. You don't return them like you would return your can or bottle, but a nickel for every nip sold will go directly to the municipality in which it's sold for litter control. So they can hire some extra people to go out and do litter control projects. Well, we'll be responsible for managing that and for determining how the money is divvied up. There were some increases to the earned income tax credit. Uh, you probably might be aware of that. In addition to that, um, there is, uh, a new tax on uh, out-of-state trucking. It's called the highway use tax. It's hyper complicated. So don't ask me about exactly where the breakoff is, but essentially it's for 18 wheelers that are traveling through the state. And there are other states that have similar taxes. Remember, we don't have tolls and uh, we've dropped the idea uh, for tolls. So those are some of the things that are happening today or tomorrow they'll be voting on legalizing cannabis. DRS will be responsible for administering the tax portion of this. Um, it's something that, I, you know, it does make me laugh because I remember being in the legislature in the late 90s and there was there were a few people that were always talking about legalizing cannabis and I was like, ah, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Well, it's happening, right? We know Rhode Island just legalized. Massachusetts has done a very good job at rolling out their legalization initiative. New York has legalized. Uh, so we're surrounded. So at this point, it probably doesn't make any sense for us not to. It's not a big, by the way, tax revenue generator. It's worth about 50 million a year. Sounds a lot like that. That's a lot of money to me. I know it's a lot of money to you, but in the context of the state budget, it's really not uh, that uh, um, big of a, a plus to us. Um, we're also looking at uh, some other things, um, you know, as it relates to initiatives. Uh, that we think are going to be critical for the state. We'll be rolling those out, communicating with, with Eric at CBIA so he can communicate with your membership and let you know what uh, we have on the boards uh, for you. Um, we did provide a significant, significant bump to um, local municipalities. This is critical. And as, as a former mayor, you know, right now I would be done sweating, but in May and in April, I, I, in, in March, when I was putting our budget together, uh, by the way, Danbury has, this is their fourth straight year of no tax increase. I started that trend, but um, it was something that you'd worry about. Do you have enough money for schools? Do you have enough money for your police officers, your firefighters, your um, programs and services that you're running? So this is going to be a big help to them, uh, in particular, some of the urban uh, places like New Haven and Hartford, where a lot of their property is off books. In other words, it's owned by the state or it's owned by a nonprofit. They don't pay taxes. We're trying to make them whole on that. Um, we have restaurant relief in there for those of you that own restaurant in the form of uh, if there are a sales tax free week, you'll be able to keep your sales tax in your restaurant for the week. You have three weeks that you can pick from. It's not three weeks long, but you can pick one of three weeks uh, that work best for your business, depending on if you're a summer business or you know, maybe, you're, maybe you have more parties in the, in the winter or around the holidays. Um, so you'll be able to pick what you want. Um, I want to thank CBIA, CBIA and also for helping us stabilize the unemployment fund, the large influx of cash there. As Eric mentioned, that his opening remarks will be really important. We also uh, finally got on board with online wagering and sports betting. By the way, I never did it the way it was currently set up, but I used to go to 
Super Bowl parties and probably three quarters of the room are looking at their phones and making bets with other out of state companies. So this will allow us to you know, keep some of that money in state. Um, and uh, uh, we've done very well at providing resources for our own um, agency for DRS. I'll also tell you that, that and you probably read about this or heard about this, that the state of Connecticut is facing a retirement cliff. And it really is starting to hit now, although the drop dead date, if you will, is not till next year. Um, so I turn my computer on pretty much every morning and I will get a notification that somebody's retiring. In fact, when I first became the commissioner and I walked in to kind of, you know, look at the office and to look around and find out where the paper clips are, I ran into three very nice, wonderful employees. Each of them introduced themselves. Um, and each of them started off by saying, hi, my name is Joe. Um, nice to meet you, Commissioner. Congratulations. But you won't really know me very well because I'm retiring in three weeks. And the other one said, hi, my name is Susie. Uh, yeah, me too. You won't know me very well. I'm retiring in a month and a half. So we've got a significant retirement cliff uh, that's happening. We are hiring like crazy at DRS. Um, but we're also looking, to, I look at this as opportunity. And I said that to the governor the other day. I said, we have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity to become more lean, to be able to cross train people, to be able to get uh, less employees to do more of the work, to automate. Um, we got to really jump on that because this is our moment in time uh, that we can save significant amount of money. And we know that uh, employees are one of the major cross uh, major drivers of our budget. So um, let's uh, uh, continue to work on that path. And, and again, the, the governor has been great about listening and um, certainly about uh, implementing ideas and thoughts uh, that we have. So um, it's been a great time for me and I like to have fun at work because um, you're not on this earth too long. And uh, I've been, it's been an honor for me to serve you uh, in the state of Connecticut. I look forward to, to having a, a strong relationship with CBIA and, and making sure that we're responsive to all your needs. Um, we have a great staff. And if you ever are having problems, just, you know, you can email me, you can email um, uh, anybody on the team and, and we'll get back to you right away. We may not have the answer right away, but we will get back to you right away and we'll, we'll close the loop eventually trying to help you out. But though I got to warn you, some of these tax things are highly, highly complicated. And that's one of the challenges I think that we have uh, in state government is that we need to uh, look at um, our tax scheme and, and, and certainly make it a lot more simple for people to understand because some of these problems that come across my desk, you, you just, they're so complicated. It really takes us months to untangle what happened in a certain situation. So, um, Again, we look forward to working with you. Thank you for this opportunity to, to share some thoughts with you. I, I touched on a lot of things. Happy to have some question and answer, and um, we'll be happy to uh, try to, to hit those questions for you and um, hopefully uh, uh, address some things that you might be concerned about. Eric? Absolutely, Commissioner. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, let, let's get into some questions. Um, you know, you, you were talking about some of the highlights, uh, you know, very positively about the legislative session. Um, now, you've worn many hats, as we talked about in the, uh, int the introduction. Um, you were formerly a, a, a legislator, you were a mayor, and now you're a commissioner. How would you rate the 2021 legislative session as a, as a, for as a legislator, as a mayor, and now as the commissioner of the Department of Revenue Services? Eric, uh, that's a great question. So um, how would I rate it? Um, look, I'm a fiscal conservative. I'm a strong fiscal conservative. I've always been, um, but I'm a social libertarian, right? So I don't want to be in your bed. I don't want to be in your bedroom. I don't want to tell you how to live, what to do. As long as you're not hurting anybody, I frankly don't care. Um, on the fiscal side of the house, I think we made some big steps this last session. I think that we um, definitely um, have uh, bent the cost curve on some of our long-term expenses, pension, stuff that you read about, the horror stories you hear about all the time. We have more work to do there. But I, I will tell you this, and it's, it's not really well known, but for example, my, my own personal self, right? People said, oh, I know why you're going to the state. You're going to the state because you're going to get a pension. Well, really? No, I'm not. Because I'm in what's called tier four. 
Tier four is essentially a, a modified 457 plan. Um, it's not the Cadillac pension that you hear about all the time. You have to work 10 years. I most likely, as you know, won't be here 10 years because I'm coterminous with the governor in his term. Now, some governors keep people around if they, you know, if they sort of feel that uh, it helps them. But a lot of times they want to, you know, put their own people in. And I get that. Um, so, and even with my legislative years, I under tier four, I can't roll them in. So I've lost those years of the time that I was at, uh, at the state of Connecticut. So I didn't do this for a pension. But that's an example of how, you know, the abuses, if you will, that took place in the past don't take place anymore. And when I tell people that, they're like, oh, well, all right, well, okay, I, I see now. So uh, there are a lot of things that have happened over the last couple of years that have bent the cost curve. You just don't see it right now, but in the out years, you'll see it. We, we really will need to work closely when it comes to pensions on offering on a voluntary basis, some kind of buyout program, um, these are things that we've talked about internally, some kind of way of, of trying to change our balance sheet a little bit on the, that long-term play. But, you know, at the end of the day, we made a promise, a commitment, a contract with people. You have to honor that, right? So that's how uh, uh, challenges on the pension side. So I think we've made taken some positive steps by funding pensions, especially the teacher's retirement, by putting money back in there, not hitting our rainy day fund. Um, I was very impressed with that. Uh, do, do I agree with every single thing that went through? No, but as you know, a legislative session is a give and take. Would I have voted for that budget? Absolutely. Yes, I would have voted for, for the budget that was put down there, um, particularly as it, it actually got better as late in the session came on. Initially, um, what happens is the governor puts out his budget or her budget, legislature takes it, they mess around with it. They come out with theirs. You're like, oh, we can't do that. That's, that's why we do that. And then it, things kind of reset back um, to where we started from with the governor's budget. And that's what happened here. So I, I think uh, Melissa McCaw, our secretary of OPM, her team and the governor's team, us at DRS, I think all three, all three pieces did a great job on putting together, I think, a, a very strong budget. So I'd give them an AM budget on the social stuff. I'm really not, again, you know, I, do I think we need to do things with equity? Of course. Do I think that, um, uh, I think marijuana didn't go as smoothly as anybody wanted it. I know the governor initially was concerned about how that came out. I think he's much more comfortable today when they vote on it than, than he was uh, three weeks ago. Um, but that's kind of, it's how the sausage is made. It's such a, I hate saying that because I used to hear that and go, oh, stop it. But it really is, right? You don't want to necessarily look under the hood to see what's happening. But in the end, what comes out is pretty good. So I think they did a, a, a very, a good job at tackling some difficult issues, but most importantly, we're positioned not to collapse if we have, God forbid, an economic collapse or another round of COVID where, you know, one of these variants pops up and becomes a real problem. We're really strongly positioned. All right, next question I have. And, and folks uh, who are viewing online, don't hesitate to drop a, a question into either the chat function or the Q&A function. And, we will uh, certainly make an effort to uh, to address that. Um, Commissioner, last summer, uh, the department announced the first phase of the modernization effort, and you talked briefly about that uh, in your remarks. And it's my understanding that phase two is, uh, is set to launch very soon. Can you give us a little preview of, of what's to come? Sure, I mean, this is a four-year modernization effort. It's on time, it's on budget. Uh, thanks to the people at DRS that have worked so hard um, they did this during a pandemic, by the way, which is not easy to do. Um, the goals of, of this core system are to improve the customer experience, deliver user-friendly features, and we just want you to spend less time with us on the screen and more time working on your business. One of the, one of the reasons we have a tax gap is that, you know, that restaurateur that's got five waiters and maybe a small business, but he's doing okay, he or she does not have time to sit there staring at a screen, trying to figure out what the legalese means to be able to file their taxes. So we, we understand that and we need to drive down um, uh, how you do that to a, an understandable fashion. There's always people that once your business gets to a certain point, obviously you need a, 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 a professional handling a lot of what you pay. But I have to tell you that, you know, probably 60% of our businesses out there are small and medium sized run by sole proprietorships, entrepreneurs, or LLCs, and those folks, they may not be able to afford an accountant. So 
we need to make sure that people can use it because if you can't use it, you're not going to you're not going to pay, and if you don't pay, we all lose out. So um, that's been really the cornerstone of what we've been doing. And I'll tell you that a, a core system is never ever finished. I did one um, in uh, in my old job at the city of Danbury, and it really took us years. And there's we still just before I left, we finally completed our uh, building permit module. Um, that you can access online. So it's never done. It, it's always something that continues to get worked on. Um, then there'll be new functionality in the phase two piece. So you'll have uh, corporate taxes, excise taxes will be added to my Connect CT. Um, and we'll be uh, sharing some more with you that later on. So you'll be able to do all that versus uh, under the old system. That's great to hear. And, you know, we certainly appreciate uh, at CBIA um, the collaborative effort that uh, that your department and, uh, and and we have always engaged in to get that information out to our membership. So um, we certainly look forward to partnering with you again on that. And, and your staff is phenomenal about sharing that information. So uh, please extend our, our thanks to all of them. Now, Commissioner, um, during the pandemic, we saw uh, an increase in telecommuting, and obviously that uh, needed to be addressed at the legislature um, to, to talk about how that's going to impact income tax filings in the future. Um, what other trends are you seeing uh, as a result of the pandemic and, and just in general uh, related to state taxation? Um, I think that... Um... You'll see, I think, I think telework is here to stay. Um, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think uh, we've had people, and, and there, I just read an article on this before I came on this morning, but, but I've seen it too in our agency. We have about 600 employees, but I, I, we've had people that are retiring because they would stay working if they could telework, but we're now after July 1 requiring people to come in the building for about 50% of the time. And they're, they probably would have stayed with us for another year if they could work from home, but now that they have to drive in, they're like, forget it, I'm gonna retire. I mean, they were gonna retire anyways, but we might've held them an extra year. Um, so that is out there. I think that there'll be uh, more discussion about the workplace. And I actually, I'm kind of fascinated by that, about what does the 21st century workplace look like? Now, the irony here is we were talking prior to the pandemic with our unions about, they wanted teleworking and we were like, oh, you can't do it. The technology doesn't exist, there's no way. You know, we have, we have a very high level of security at DRS because we handle so much um, data that uh, is not for public uh, uh, you know, consumption. So uh, we're like, there's no way. And you know, we got a pandemic, we figured out how to do it pretty quickly. You know, we set up a VPN, we've got people out there, you know, we know I know when you click your mouse, um, you know, not that we do stuff like that, but we can if we need to. Um, so you can, there are ways you can manage people that are, that are working from uh, their home office or maybe coming in only a couple of days a week. I think you'll see more of that. And because of that, that's really impacted the convenience of the employer rule. And I know you're familiar with that. I don't want to get too much into it because it's super complicated. Um, but essentially, it, you know, when people are ordered home by a governor or a mayor and their, their home happens to be out of state, the question is, well, where do you pay taxes? Normally you used to pay in New York. If you paid in New York, uh, you got a credit from Connecticut, but now you're paying in Connecticut. Now you're working in Connecticut. We expect you to pay in Connecticut. So we gave you a credit this year for 2020. We're not giving you a credit next year. Either you go back to work or you're gonna have to pay in two places. Now you still can get a credit. You know, If you're three days here or two days there, people do do that. They pay partial taxes in both places. Um, uh, but there's gonna, we're gonna have to sort that out this year coming up. Um, but I do think, and I, and I think your, your membership would agree, I think there's more discussion to have related to teleworking. And, and I, you know, I don't, I personally don't like it, but I, and I'm, I'm not doing it. I, you know, I do a couple of days a week. I work from my apartment, a couple of days a week, I work from DRS. Um, but only personally, I don't like it. Like, is it a good thing for your business? I don't know. I, you know, maybe we have happier employees if they can walk the dog four times a day. I don't know. I mean, that's, and, and if the productivity is the same, look, we can, you can check our productivity any day of the week just by looking at our collections. If we're not collecting. We're not doing our audits. We're not doing our enforcement actions. Obviously it's not working. Well, we're way ahead of our, our collections. So, so we've seen, you know, good results from it. Is it does it become the future? It may. Uh, and I think that's something that'll be interesting. I appreciate that. 
Um, final question for you, uh, Commissioner, um, and this is probably the most important one. Um, you made national headlines as mayor for helping to rename a sewage plant in Danbury after a late night talk host, show host, John Oliver. Has Governor Lamont given you the power to rename the DRS building? <laughs> you know, um, I gotta tell you, the governor's got a great sense of humor. Uh, we hang out a lot. Um, he loves when I do stuff like that. I mean, he just loves it. So here's a couple, here's some things to look forward to. One, uh, starting in, looks like July, we're gonna launch a, if you remember from my office and as mayor, I had live at five. We're doing something with DRS very similar to that. I even have Taylor coming back to read questions. She's the off camera person. And uh, we're gonna talk taxes, but we're also gonna talk Netflix, uh, Hulu, what you should be watching or reading or, and, and stuff like that. Um, two, uh, that sewer plant is probably one of the most visited sites in Connecticut. Uh, I happen to live fairly close to it and people drive from all over the country to take their picture in front of the John Oliver sign. In fact, I talked to a couple from New Zealand uh, about two weeks ago on a Saturday that was there taking their picture uh, in front of the John Oliver Memorial sewer plant. So it's been quite a, uh, a tourist attraction. I'm trying to get the governor to, to let Danbury put up, you know, one of those signs saying exit six, John Oliver Memorial sewer plant. Um, and uh, uh, we've had people that, you know, want to sell little trinkets there and things like that. So it's kind of crazy. And um, he is definitely game for doing a lot of stuff like that. So We'll see. He was in a race car on Friday night. I was highly jealous. He went to meet Michael Waltrip and everybody. Superstar Racing was up at Stafford Springs and uh, I couldn't go and he wanted me to go with him, but um, I'm a big NASCAR fan. But anyways, you'll be seeing more stuff named after people. If we can generate some money from it, we'll do it. Yeah, that's right. It was great for charity as well. So, um, and, and we certainly look forward to uh, to, to that show that you're, uh, you're going to start putting on in the future. Well, Commissioner, uh, many thanks for taking the time uh, to talk with us this morning. Uh, we appreciate your leadership at DRS and look forward to working with you and your agency in the future. Uh, for those who are, are watching, uh, we're going to take a short 10-minute break and return around 9 o'clock with the latest on Connecticut tax policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Now we have two speakers with us today who are gonna tell you about what did happen with the state tax policy over the long five plus month of this year's General Assembly session. These guys have an incredibly tough job today because the, legislat the legislation that actually implements uh, the budget and the tax policies were just finalized this morning and filed uh, very early today. It's an 837 page document uh, to go through and so, um, this is going to be an incredibly difficult job for these guys, uh, but uh, we have two experts here who are going to be able to help us out with that. So please welcome Robert Osmond, partner with PwC's National Tax Services Practice, and Lou Schatz, a partner and chair of Shipman and Goodwin's Tax and Employee Benefits Practice Group. Robert, Lou, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Hey, Molly, I'm having trouble with the video, uh, it, but it says it's disabled. So if you want to try to do it from your end, that would be helpful. But uh, with that, if we can pull up the presentation. Excellent. Thank you. If we go ahead, want to go ahead and start to the agenda, please. So we're going to cover a little bit about the budget developments. And as Eric mentioned, right, uh, they're fresh and hot off the press. So what we really have is kind of the overview and insights we're getting as we're going into this special session. But we'll give you what we know. Uh, on top of that, we're going to talk a little bit about Connecticut and the CARES Act and other conformity issues, along with some residency issues. And uh, we're going to close out with some pass-through entity tactics. So with that, why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide and the following slide. Great, thanks. So as we kind of wind up to think about what's going on with Connecticut, you know, it's kind of interesting as to what's happened over the last year. And we think about this, we were looking back in June of 2020 to think about where we are in June of 2021. I don't think, um, I don't think 
uh, we'd expect to be where we're at from a standpoint of budgets, because everybody going into last year was thinking that budgets were going to be dire and states were reacting accordingly by cutting budgets, uh, reducing expenses, and then even starting to you know think about tax raises and uh, looking at adjusting NOLs and credits. And we saw that in some other states, you know, with California kind of taking the lead. Uh, California, you know, it, it's uh, kind of suspended their credits and capped it at five million per year for 2020 through 2022, and they limited their NOLs to only if you had taxable income of a million. And so in looking at Connecticut, where we are today is obviously they have more money than they thought they were going to have, right? Budget surpluses are at a, at a high, right? Surging to nearly a half billion dollars. Uh, they have, uh, the budget office projects 470 million surplus uh, for the fiscal year that ends June 30th up uh, 220 from what was forecasted in the prior month. And the volatility adjustment program now holds over a billion dollars. So definitely uh, better than where we thought we'd be. And, and uh, Rob, going, if, oh, if I could sorry, just, just add, yep. um, you know, indicative of, of the positive sign that uh, for in Connecticut for the first time in 20 years, uh, a rating agency uh, improved uh, the, the ratings on the Connecticut bonds. Uh, again, first time in 20 years, Connecticut got an upgrade. So, and it's all, you know, that's fantastic. And part of it's because of the American Rescue Plan too, right? The federal government yep. gave the states a lot of money that helped upshore the budgets. And we're seeing how, you know, Connecticut and other states are reacting to that money about how they can spend it or how they can improve their fiscal, you know, solvency overall. Um, but going into the session this year, right, we expected a lot to happen on the tax side. There was a lot of discussion around tax increases and adjustments that were going to happen. And what's interesting about the bill is, uh, you know, most of what we have is a lot of things that didn't happen with some things that did. So if we go to the next slide, Molly, um, this kind of reminds me of a line from a movie where a waitress asks two police officers, what would you like to have for breakfast? And the police officers start citing a bunch of things. And she says, uh, basically, none of that stuff's available. All you can have is steak and potatoes, right? And so if we look at what didn't happen on the next slide, um, right, we can see that there was discussed a lot about... Um, doing a consumption tax, right? There was a gain, a capital gains tax, payroll taxes, digital ad tax, transportation tax, a health insurance assessment, and a highway use tax. Out of all of those, none of them passed except the highway use tax was approved separately. So if we kind of look at what happened, and I don't know, Molly, if you can flip to the next slide because I'm still on the previous one. And, and Rob, Rob, before we leave this this slide, yep. it, it's it's very informative because even though it didn't happen this year, next slide, Molly, it, even though it didn't happen right this year, th this is this could be a sign of things to come. If, if Connecticut does have uh, budgetary issues in the future, one could imagine that these are the types of taxes that the legislature might look to. Uh, the increase in the capital gains tax would have would have applied uh, a two two percent tax uh, for people with income over a million dollars, 2% on their capital gain. The digital ads tax uh, was a, a sales tax uh, that applied to digital ads. And this is a tax, as, as Rob can attest, that is getting increasing attention from states all over the country. Uh, and, and again, uh, it, who, who knows if, if this is something that the legislature looks at again next year. The, the payroll tax is an interesting idea that's, um, it, it's been sort of talked about for several years now, it, it would be a work around the $10,000 state local tax limitation. Uh, it, uh, New York has a form of the payroll tax, it's optional, uh, but it's very complicated. It would be difficult to implement. Uh, and so I think a lot of people in the business community were were uh, pleased that the payroll tax didn't, did not make it. Rob? What this reminds me of, Lou, is like when we started hearing about combined reporting. Right? right. In a lot of states and in Connecticut, right, combined reporting would come up again and again and eventually get thrown aside and not passed until, lo and behold, it becomes law. I think that these are things that we can, uh, you know, if we look at our crystal ball, we may see in the future or some version of them. If the budget changes and they need to bring up revenue, especially with the digital ad tax, depending upon how things go in Maryland, a number of states are looking at that as a good way in which to effectively export the tax to industries that are not necessarily based in the state. And there, you know, there's no better tax policy sometimes than to be able to export the tax to others who don't live there. And so that's in part what they may be looking at. And a lot of states are looking at that. So we'll wait to see what happens, but uh, at least for this year, it's good news of a lot of things that didn't happen. Right. 
if we go ahead and flip to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about what did happen. And one more then, Molly. Thanks. So, um, you know, not unexpectedly, we saw that the corporate surcharge got extended. So this is the temporary tax that always stays temporary, but never quite goes away. Uh, they extended it through 2022. So the good news is it didn't get extended much more beyond that, but it is obviously something that we're gonna need to think about uh, as we look at 2021 and 2022 provisions. Uh, we, Go ahead. Luke. So, Rob, just to, to summarize for those, those who may not recall, the corporate surcharge is a 10% tax on top of the tax that you already owe as a corporation. The tax that you owe is currently the 7.5% rate. So, that 10% gets you up to eight and a quarter. But uh, fortunately for many, that surcharge doesn't apply if your gross revenue is under 100 million. Um, it, unless you file a combined return, that, that in that case, the surcharge would apply. But, but as Rob said, uh, now extended through 2022. Right, but it, again, it's a short extension. So there's hope yet that it can go away. <laughs> right. uh, the key of the extension for our taxpayers to think about is obviously the provision, right? So if this becomes enacted, because right now it's just, you know, it's proposed, uh, but if enacted, especially if it's enacted by June 30th, and that's the expectation, this will be something that you'll need to take into account for purposes of your provision this quarter. And, a flat, you know, we're adjust your, your deferreds for the incremental surcharge, at least in 2022. Right. In addition, right, the capital tax that was expected to be phased out from 2021 through 2023 is going to start a phase out in 2024. So this one's a little bit longer, uh, but they're going to keep the capital tax around for a few more years before they start the phase. Out. And obviously that will be budget dependent upon what happens. Um, and, you know, maybe again in 2024, they'll kick the can down the road. But at least for now, we can expect that the capital tax will be phased out in a few years in the future. And Rob, I, I did have a chance this morning to look at the, the, the this morning's implementer. The, the phase out would be complete by, by 2028. Uh, <clears throat> again, th this capital tax is an alternative tax. You have, to, as a corporation, you have to compute your regular tax and then you compute the capital base tax and you pay the higher of the two. Uh, the, the elimination of the capital tax would, would make things much simpler on the corporate side in Connecticut, and it's something that we're all looking forward to. So what's interesting is recently the FASB came out with changes around how to account for capital taxes like this when you pay the greater of, right? And they actually have clarified that when you pay the greater of, uh, that the component of this should be included as part of the provision versus above the line. So again, given that the phase out doesn't start till 2024, that's something for us to think about. In addition, because of the capital tax, you may want to and need to reevaluate your credits, right? Before you may have been thinking that your credits were going to be, you know, unutilizable because the capital tax was going away and maybe you're not a net income taxpayer. So as a result of that, you may need to reevaluate this quarter, what the impact is on your credits as it relates to uh, the capital tax, the ability to use them. So that's and just, again, I, things yeah. to think about. And, and I guess similarly, Rob, if you were uh, calculating your estimated taxes in 2021 on the assumption that the capital tax would be would get start to phased out, you need now have to recalculate your estimated taxes. That's true. And so we'll wait to see from guidance from the department about how they're going to adjust estimated tax payments to allow right. taxpayers so there's no underpayment penalties. And historically, if I remember, Connecticut's been pretty good about that it has in been. providing, you know, waivers and adjustments for law changes that come, you know, I'll call it mid-year. So kind of moving on, there's some, been some credit developments. The good news is this R&D credit's going to be restored to 70%. It's phased in over two years. Currently, if you recall, it is 50.1%. So they could say, obviously, it was greater than 50, but just barely. Uh, going forward, in a couple of years, it would be 70%, right? And what, what's interesting is it creates a newly, uh, the carry forward of newly earned credits is going to be limited to 15%. And Lou, I didn't get a chance to look at the bill to see how that works in, but my my, my thought process on this is that it was for the non-discretionary R&D credit that pre is currently unlimited. It, it appears as if they're going to make that 15 years. I, I, I would agree with you, Rob. I, I have not had a chance to verify that as well. So um, I guess the uh, something to look forward to is more insight you know, from PwC and from Lou and others around what this implication will mean as the bill comes to the floor and we're able to kind of digest it. But something to think about is, is what that credit limitation may do 
uh, going forward. And also, we definitely make, want to make sure that it's really a prospective change and not a retroactive change in the way that the law reads. So something to look forward to in the next couple of weeks is good clarity around that. In addition, they modified the film production credits to allow it to be claimed against sales tax. Uh, it's capped at 78% 70 of the total tax credit, but if you don't have an income tax liability, the ability to use it against sales tax is obviously an advantage. Mm -hmm. Uh, two last comments to make on this slide is uh, Rob. Before to, you oh, uh, sure, before you leave tax credits, uh, one item that did not make its way into our outline is the uh, current limitation in Connecticut on the ability to take tax credits. Uh, right mm -hmm. right now, you can only take uh, tax credits up to fifty point oh one percent of your your income, and I, I always wonder why it was fifty point oh one percent and not fifty percent. And I think that's because Massachusetts was fifty percent, and we wanted to be at a little higher than Massachusetts, but in any event, uh, the, the ability to take credits will be increased over the next several years uh, on, under the implementer bill to 60% of your income in 2022, of your tax liability in 2022, and 70% in 2023. So the, the ability to take credits will be increased over the next several years. So Lou, we had noted that for the R&D credit. Is it broader than the R&D credit? It's applying to all credits then? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, perfect. And so I always thought you, you you looked at Massachusetts that you wanted to be better than Massachusetts. I always looked at it as maybe they just simply wanted to say that we're giving you greater than 50%, right? <laughs> they gave you that extra 10th so they could say it. So that's right. always been the line I've used kind of the discussion. Yeah. Um, uh, another amnesty is on its way, right? We, uh, again, need to get some of the details around that, but what we've seen so far is that it's going to run from November 1st, 2021 through January 31st, 2022. It's going to reduce uh, penalties and interest by 75%, and it's also going to allow for taxpayers that are already in accounts receivable, right? There's a number of open points that we need to kind of get our head around of what it, you know, it, how it impacts existing issues and audits. And what, what, if any, limitation of look back it has, and et cetera. But again, if you're currently under audit with some discussions around the department, this is something to look to that maybe you want to try to settle it in November versus accelerating those. So. Yeah, so a couple thoughts on, on amnesty. Um, Connecticut seems to have its, its last amnesty program every, every couple of years. And, and uh, the, the most recent last amnesty program was the so-called Fresh Start program which ran from October 2017 to November 2018. It was a tremendous success. I think they budgeted 50 million or so as increased income and they generated over hundred million. Uh, th this budget item is 40 million. And um, I, I did take a quick look, Rob, this morning. It, it looks like there's an eight year look back here. So it looks like that you, you would have to come forward and pay your, uh, your tax liability from 20, 2012 forward to get the full benefit of the amnesty. Um, and, and prior to 2012, they, they'll, they won't look back to um, the 75% interest reduction is significant. It's the, the last, the last uh, amnesty program had a 50% interest deduction. And so this is 75%. It's larger than the last am amnesty program. Uh, Connecticut, as many of you are aware, has a very high uh, interest rate on assessments. It's 1% a month or 12% a year. So this would effectively reduce uh, your interest from 12% down to 3% if you come in and, and uh, participate in the amnesty program. The, the, the program itself will, will be um, unwrapped by the Department of Revenue Services. They'll, they'll come out with uh, extensive notice or release uh, later on in the summer, and, and there'll be a, probably a detailed process to apply and, and um, <clears throat> come under the program. But it, it's a it's a welcome program, and I uh, look forward to seeing how it works out. Rob. And so pe people should evaluate, right? If they haven't, if they've started a VDA but they're not really deep into it, if they're thinking about a VDA, what the benefits of doing the VDA would be over the amnesty, right? Obviously, you get only twenty five percent or seventy five percent reduction of penalties and interest, where the VDA you can get all the penalties waived, right? But none of the interest. So you just kind of got to do the math including the number of years you look back too. So at least in the VDA side, there may be you know, advantages one way or the other for you to consider. That, that's a really good point. Uh, the, the VDA process in Connecticut is a three or 40 year look back depending upon uh, what the DRS will accept in your situation. And, and so you're correct that you'd have the three or 40 year look back, but you'd pay 100% interest versus maybe going back 
eight years with with the seventy five percent interest reduction. So so there is uh, you know I, I, an, an analysis that needs to be done there. Plus the twenty five percent penalty on the eight year piece versus no penalties usually on a BDA. So Correct. again, it's all part of the math that you'd want to do in the exercise. Uh, and but where I really see the opportunity is if you're under audit and are in appeals with the department, this may be an opportunity to you know again we got to look for the details to make sure what they're willing to accept. But perhaps you can close out some longstanding issues and get some of the interest and penalty waived and you know have certainty about how things get resolved. Right. The, the VDA process, as we all know, only applies if you have not yet been approached by the DRS um, and, you, and you're approaching them coming forward first. Yep. Yep. So, uh, and then, Lou, they talked about implementing the CARES revenue uh, initiative. So uh, I don't have any experience around the CARES component. I don't know if you have any insight on that to provide or no. I, I don't. Oh, other I, said, than I said CARES. I meant Yeah, you I meant create, create. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, sorry. I, I used to, I assume this is just uh, in increased uh, money for DRS enforcement, which I, I think is probably a good thing. Okay. All right. Because when I was trying to look it up and get some more detail around it, it really seemed to be tied, at least what I saw, I was seeing it tied to more about the department, uh, the overall governmental retirement and about retirement funding and components like that. But maybe there's a component of enforcement that helps support it. So again, more details to come in the next couple of weeks. Yep. Uh, Molly, you want to flip to the next slide? So insurance companies tax, right? They're gonna raise the aggregate cap on insurance uh, reinvestment funds, right? They're gonna implement a, a captive insurance initiative, tax amnesty to bring captive insurers to Connecticut, right? Anticipate revenue gains in fiscal 22 from a three-year look back. So, uh, I, you know, a lot of people have captives. A lot of people have captives that are formed outside of Connecticut. And again, this looks like an opportunity to come forward. And maybe if you have some, um, you know, self-procurement taxes that you need to pay, they're going to allow people to come forward and clean some of that up. And Lou, I don't know if you have any experience or comments around the captive? Nope, that, that sounds great, Rob. All right, so with that, uh, you're going to cover personal income tax? Yeah, on the uh, personal income tax, uh, there is currently an exemption for uh, those making under $100,000. A portion of their pension income is exempt from a Connecticut income tax and and this is one of the responses that the legislature made in order to avoid uh, retirees from going to Florida and um, not having to worry about tax on their pension or annuities. Uh, the, the change this year is to extend that exemption or at least a percentage of the money that you receive from the pension, pensions and annuities to extend that exemption to individual retirement accounts, not Roth IRAs, but, but regular IRAs. So that exemption would, would kick in in 2023 and be fully exempt by 2026. So, so again, those making $100,000 uh, receiving IRA distributions, a part of the distributions will be exempt beginning in 2023, fully exempt by uh, 2026. Uh, in addition, uh, on the personal income tax side, it's, it's not on the slide, but there, there is a credit right now against the personal income tax. And several years ago, uh, that credit uh, of several hundred dollars was limited to those over age 65 or those with uh, dependents. Um, it, the credit was supposed to then was supposed to become ex, uh, back and available to everybody uh, in 2021, but they extended the limited group of folks that can take the credit. They've extended that to 2022. So the credit again for 2021, 2022 against the personal income tax is only available for those over 65 or those, those with, with dependents. Uh, on the sales and use tax side, uh, this was an unusually quiet year for the sales tax. Uh, we, we've gone through Wayfair over the last couple of years and uh, market facilitators and referral, referrers. Um, we've had significant sales and use tax uh, legislation uh, as far back as I can remember. Uh, this, this year, there's one exemption to the sales and use tax that was adopted, uh, they, they've exempted uh, breast breastfeeding supplies, and that um, sales tax exemption is effective July first, twenty twenty one. In addition, uh, a, um, a a change was made to assist uh, the restaurant industry. Uh, I, I believe that industry was looking to get a a percentage of the sales tax carved out and allocated uh, to that industry, uh, but the compromise was that there was gonna be uh, one, one week's worth of sales tax relief for the restaurants. 
uh, be curious to see what, what week that, that is. Um, that's, that's to come. On the excise tax side, uh, there's, there's a reduction in the excise tax uh, on beers. And also there's a, uh, now a ban that's gonna be effective January 1st, 2022 on flavored uh, vaping products. Again, that ban on flavored vaping products would become effective January 1st, 2022, assuming this, this bill is adopted. And then finally, uh, on the admissions tax side, uh, Connecticut has a admissions tax of 10% of the price of admission to events. Uh, that tax has been repealed uh, effective July 1st, 2021. So if you go to an event between now and the end of June, you'll have to pay the 10%. If you wait till after the end of June, uh, the tax will be waived. Uh, in, in many respects, the, the, the tax uh, had very little impact in Connecticut because there is a whole list, eight, nine, or 10 uh, venues in Connecticut who are already exempt from the admissions tax. Uh, so th this tax was not generating a lot of revenue. And I think it's a, a welcome uh, change to see the, uh, the tax uh, eliminated. Next slide, please. Two bills that were uh, adopted uh, early in the session. Uh, the first was a bill that applied to the creation of qualified data centers. And there, there's a typo in the slide. It, it, it was, uh, the bill was enacted March 4th, 2021. It was enacted March 4th. It's effective July 1st. So the bill was enacted March 4th. And this, this bill, the purpose of this bill is to incentivize uh, the creation organization of uh, large data centers in Connecticut. This is for the storage of data. And, and this is something that is, um, again, moving across the country. Rob, you could probably talk to what's going on in other states. Uh, in Connecticut, the way this is going to work is that if you want to build one of these large data centers, and there's probably a very small subset of people that this would apply to, uh, you would go to the Department of Economic and Community Development and you would enter into an agreement with DECD. The agreement would either be 20 years or, at the, or, or 40 years. So it's a very long-term agreement. And if you get the benefit of the agreement, you'll have sales tax uh, exemptions and you'll also have property tax exemption or reductions. Um, the, to, to qualify for the data center, you, you've got to make an investment in, in the new data center of at least uh, 50 million if you're uh, in an enterprise zone or an opportunity zone. If you're not in an enterprise zone or an opportunity zone, the investment has to be um, 200 million. So these are, these are large projects uh, and the, the goal and the objective is to bring these projects to Connecticut. I think it's a worthy cause and, and, and we'll see what happens. Rob, you have any thoughts on, on that legislation? Um, I mean, what I've seen in other jurisdictions is that it's definitely been an incentive for people to put the data centers there yeah. because of the huge cap spend that happens with those, the power needs, the infrastructure around it, uh, the value to the, you know, the city and the local government is just having that in place. Uh, it has a number of jobs that obviously go with it too. Although typically I haven't seen, you know, a ton of, it's not like a factory where you're going to have hundreds right. of people there, but you definitely have some high paying jobs that uh, maintain it and the infrastructure around it that actually helps support it. Uh, so, it's, you know, it's good to have and definitely will be helpful. Um, and I've seen activity of it in the Midwest as a, as a result. Yeah. So the next uh, uh, bullet refers to uh, HB 6516, and we'll talk about this uh, a little further on as well. But uh, th this was a, a very positive development that the governor and the commis commissioner Boughton at DRS uh, worked together to uh, implement in, in early March, coming out of a lot of concern in 2020 as to whether Connecticut residents who work for out-of-state employers might be subject to double tax on their income. So the, the, the classic case is you have a New York employer with a Connecticut resident during the pandemic out of necessity. The Connecticut resident could not go into New York, so was working out of her home in Fairfield or Stanford. And because of the convenience of employer rule that Rob is going to discuss shortly, New York announced that it is going to continue to tax uh, the income of Connecticut residents who are working out of their home for necessity, not for their convenience. And the concern that was raised is, well, if Connecticut, uh, so that employee, that Connecticut resident employee is paying tax to New York on New York wages, 
And also because the employee is resident in Connecticut, she's paying tax to Connecticut on her wages. And the question was, could she get a tax credit for the taxes paid to New York? And it, it really is an un, unknown area because the employee was in Connecticut out of necessity, not, not for her, her own convenience. And what, what this HB 6516 or Public Act 21-3 does is it provides a credit. It does provide the credit to the Connecticut resident for taxes paid to New York, uh, which is terrific relief to Connecticut residents. Uh, it also applies to those who have Massachusetts employers and are, are working in Connecticut out of necessity. Um, and it, 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 it's important to note that the, the statute only applies to the 2020 taxable year. So we, we still have these issues for the 2021 taxable year. So if you are working in Connecticut, again, out of necessity, January through June, for an out-of-state employer and that out-of-state employer's state is taxing your wages, there will be an issue in 2021 as to whether or not you will be entitled to a tax credit on your Connecticut return for the taxes paid to the, uh, the out-of-state employer. What this bill also does, what, and, and we'll also touch on this more, what this bill also does is that it provides that out-of-state employers whose only contact with Connecticut is a teleworker in Connecticut who's working out of necessity in Connecticut, those out-of-state employers will not have to worry about tax nexus in Connecticut for 2020. So again, if you're, if you're a New York or a Massachusetts employer, you have a Connecticut resident teleworker working it out of her home in 2020 because of necessity, then the statute provides that the Department of Revenue Services cannot go after that out-of-state employer and try to assert tax nexus. And again, this is only a 2020 solution and this issue is gonna be a hot issue for 2021. We're seeing this all over the country, similar things, yeah. right? People have passed various bills or administrative relief saying that for purposes of 2020, and we'll talk a little bit about Massachusetts, so long as the emergency provisions are, are enforced, Right, they're going to give waivers to withholding, waivers to filing, waivers to nexus for both employers and employees. Um, the fact is, is though, because of the reopening, which is all great news for us as a country, uh, it's also uh, impacting the tax analysis. Yeah. As we as we see today is the day in Massachusetts that the governor's emergency powers are no longer in effect. So um, we'll talk about it in a second. But 90 days from today, uh, Massachusetts Department's rules are going to become effective about how they treat, you know, teleworkers. Uh, but more to come, a little bit of a teaser. Uh, if we look at House Bill 6629, right, this is really about markets, uh, marketplace facilitators being required to collect or remit the 911 fee. Uh, it's the definitional change. They basically are defining them as a retailer. Retailers are subject to the collection of this fee, uh, including, you know, notifying the consumer and putting it on the invoice. This is just making marketplace facilitators subject to that same requirement of uh, notifying the consumer and collecting the, the fee amount. Uh, the other change that we wanna talk about is House Bill 6633 as it relates to the Unemployment Tech Trust Fund. A couple of key points to think about, uh, this begins in 2024. So this is not something that we're gonna have to pick up immediately, but it is something to pay attention to. A couple of items to note is that it modified the minimum maximum benefits applicable to the Unemployment Trust Fund and who's available. Most importantly for our business taxpayers, an increase the taxable wages from 15,000 to 25,000 effective in 2024. So in a few years down the road, we're gonna have just incrementally more unemployment tax. And it also expanded the experience rate and the range. The current range is half a percent to 5.4. It changes that range from a 10th of a percent to 10%. So the range obviously that bigger, along with other modifications. So again, more to come, 2024 impact, but something to keep in the back of your mind as just to the overall cost of doing business in Connecticut. So with that, Molly, why don't we flip to the next slide? So beyond Connecticut, we need to think about a little bit about what, what's happening in our neighborhood, so to speak, right? And we saw what happened in your neighborhood in, in New York. Uh, as part of the bill, 
right? They enacted in April, an increase to the corporate franchise tax temporarily at least. And so if you're not a manufacturer, because if you're a manufacturer in New York, your rate can be as low as zero. But if you're not a manufacturer, the rate increased to 7.25%. And that began uh, January 1st, 2021 uh, through 2023. The thing to remember is that because they increased the corporate franchise tax, if you're in the MTA zone as well, that surcharge that they charge in New York, around New York City, also increased because it's 30% of the tax liability uh, that you calculate, of course, to portion. In addition, New York was supposed to be phasing out their capital tax. That too got delayed until 2024. Beyond the corporate realm, they actually increased the personal income tax rate to 9.65% on income over $2.1 million, but under $5 million for married filing jointly. And on top of that, the legislation created two additional tax brackets for income over $5 million, but under $25 million, it's 10.3, and income over $25 million, it's 10.9. When you take that and add in the New York City rate on income over $25 million, Residents can be paying as much as 14.7% in state taxes. And that together is higher than what you'd be paying in California. California is at 13%. So obviously, you know, individual income tax is a big component uh, in New York and an impact. And it's driving what we'll talk about, some of the issues around uh, migration and or just temporary workforces and where people are, are thinking about working. Rob, Along this, uh, you oh, know, go ahead, it, 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 it's this is very interesting, um, and some of the older folks uh, on the call, like myself, uh, remember the 1980s when when Connecticut did not have an income tax, and Connecticut, Fairfield County in particular, was viewed as a tax shelter, and and a lot of that that's what in part drove the growth in uh, in Stanford. A lot of New York companies were leaving New York to come to Stanford. I I think this is a very welcome. Uh, result for Connecticut business generally, be, because you you now have a, a New York City <clears throat> business, uh, say an LLC with with a high income members earning, uh, being taxed at more than 14.7%. Admittedly, it's on taxable income, not adjusted gross. Comparing that with Connecticut's max of 6.99%, assuming that max stays at the 6.9, that, that's a significant difference between the New York max and the Connecticut max. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if this um, leads some uh, New York employers to think about whether or not a move to Fairfield County uh, is, is uh, in their future. Definitely, but how you then compare that then connect it into the convenience of the employer rules, you know, about, you know, ability to actually find places to work. This is all going to result, if we look at the changes that we're seeing in the, the tax department, again, of some degree of migration, right? People are right. Uh, just naturally today more mobile We'll talk about this in a minute than they were previously because we've learned we can do exactly what we're doing right here. We can do video conferences, right? We can do it from our homes. We can do it from our uh, offices, but we're not necessarily uh, committed to having to do it uh, right in where we're used to. So it's, right. we're going to see a change in the businesses going forward and tax will drive some of those decisions for our clients and ourselves. Yep. So, and Massachusetts, not to be left out, Right is, is again uh, proposing its millionaires tax. So there's a four percent surcharge that's going to go on the ballot in 2022, on the, called the millionaires tax, so that they can pay their fair share. So more to be determined. Obviously, if it goes on the ballot in 2022, I don't believe it becomes effective at least until 23 or 24. So again, just wait to see what happens, where we are politically. But something that obviously, if they increase the millionaires tax or they put a millionaires tax in Massachusetts, helps maybe uh, Connecticut with some of the you know, advantages if they don't have it. Well, what's the likelihood, Rob, of, of a millionaire's tax being approved by the residents of Massachusetts? I, I, I would I'd, assume m most of the voters are, are not, would not be subject to the tax. So that's true. Most of the voters wouldn't be subject to the tax, but I think in part would be it dependent upon the overall political environment that we're in Massachusetts. If yeah. budgets are good, right? If there's no real uh, cutting of school funding, there may be a push, a, a successful push by the business community and others to say that, look, we understand why we want to do this from a society standpoint, but here's the negative impact of how you drive talent out of Massachusetts. And, you know, one of the advantages Massachusetts has over some states is, again, the education system, the colleges, the high tech environment in Boston, which obviously attracts money and millionaires are made out of that. If you start driving those people out, just like you're seeing maybe in a California and other states, uh, people that have the ability to be mobile will become mobile. 
And so we'll just see what happens with it. Um, but my crystal ball is not very good because if it was, I would have lotto and I would be done. But <laughs> you do the best, you know, so we'll see. We'll just have to keep our ear to the ground, so to speak. So with that, Molly, can we go to the next slide? Next slide. Okay, th this is uh, this slide deals with Connecticut's response to the CARES Act. The, the, the CARES Act was adopted, uh, you probably recall, last uh, spring, spring of uh, 2020. And there were a lot of federal tax changes that came out of the CARES Act. And once the CARES Act was adopted, the issue in every state was to what extent will the particular state uh, adopt or decouple their state tax law from the changes that were made in the CARES Act. And to um, then Commissioner John Biello and his team at DRS, to their credit, uh, they were one of the first in the country to come out with um, the Connecticut's reaction and response to the CARES Act. Uh, and all of it very positive and also very logical. Uh, First of all, uh, with respect to the treatment of the federal stimulus checks, the, these were the checks, I believe it was first $1,200 and then uh, $600 that um, those with incomes under, a, other, under either 80,000 or 75,000 received throughout the year. Um, those checks are by federal statute, not subject to tax. And in Connecticut, it was also announced that Connecticut would not subject those federal stimulus checks to Connecticut income tax, again, following uh, federal law. Um, with respect to distributions from qualified retirement accounts, there was some uh, leniency at the federal level on the taxation of distributions from qualified retirement accounts and Connecticut piggybacked on the federal rules. And so it, to the extent there was any uh, adjustment, positive adjustment in the taxation of distributions from qualified retirement accounts, you also receive that benefit uh, at the Connecticut side. Um, Connecticut withholding does apply to the CARES Act pension distributions um, under the Connecticut withholding statute. There's a withholding of 6.99% on pension distributions and that would similarly apply to any CARES Act pension distributions unless the employer received a CT-W4P from the employee. Uh, the next bullet is extremely significant. Um, hundreds and thousands of uh, businesses in Connecticut applied for the payroll protection program uh, funds. And under that program, uh, the, the funds received are either treated as a loan uh, repayable to the federal government or are forgiven. And under uh, federal law, the loan, if forgiven, again, by specific statute, is excludable from federal income. And the, the question is whether or not uh, Connecticut would similarly exclude the canceled loans uh, if, if the taxpayer received an exemption from the federal government. And the, the notice that the, uh, or the OCG issued by uh, the DRS concluded that Connecticut would follow the federal treatment of the PPP loans so that if your PPP loan is forgiven uh, and you don't have to pay it back and therefore you don't have income for federal income tax purposes, Connecticut will also not look to uh, tax, that, tax that income. And similarly, in a, in a recent um, update to this uh, statute, to, to this um, notice, uh, Connecticut uh, also announced that that you will get uh, the full deduction for any expenses that were funded by the PPP loan. Um, it was a uh, an issue in 2020 as to whether or not PPP expense funded expenses would be deductible for federal purposes. There is a federal statutory amendment in December of 2020 that specifically blessed that uh, expense deduction. And Connecticut has come out with an update that also indicates that the, uh, the expense deduction will be allowed. Uh, perhaps Rob, before I go to the remaining bullets, if you wanna chat a little about the treatment of PPP monies in, in other states, because I don't think it's uniform around the country. 
it's, it's definitely not uniform around the country. And part of it becomes like how they adopt the internal revenue code, right? Yeah. So if you look at Massachusetts, it's Massachusetts is interesting because for businesses, they currently adopt the code. But for individuals, on a lot of the provisions are stuck in the code of 2005. And so because of that disconnect in how they adopt the code, the treatment of the PPP loans, the impact of the CARES Act and stuff, there's a disconnect there. And that treatment is similar in other jurisdictions as well. What we're seeing is states are obviously uh, getting some you know, guidance and I'll call it push from, from their, their taxpayers to say, hey, can we follow federal? Right. So where they can legislatively or administratively, there's been a lot of guidance in the last three or four months for those states that are not rolling conformity and follow federal to come out with their own guidance. New Hampshire just did in the last couple of weeks saying that they, too, would follow the federal treatment through, you know, uh, either legislation or administrative relief. And so it, yeah. what I would say is that if you have PPP loans beyond Connecticut and you're found beyond Connecticut, you need to look at the most recent guidance as how states are, are giving guidance around that issue for 2020 slash 2021. Yeah, and uh, I actually haven't given much thought to this, but how, how are the loans, the, how is the forgiveness going to be sourced? If you're a Connecticut business and let's say you're operating in, in three states, and you have forgiveness, it, w- would you have to source some of that uh, debt cancellation income to other states or would it all- I would ex- No, I'd expect that they're, re- because they're really saying that, hey, that income's not being taxable. It's really about what's in the tax base. And I wouldn't okay. expect there to be an apportionment change at all yeah. related to it. It's Correct. about what's in the base that's getting allocated on your normal receipts. Got it, got it, okay. Uh, the, the, the next two bullets uh, relating to uh, the five-year NOL carryback rules and the, um, l- the, the uh, rollback of the excess business loss limitation, the, these are two provisions that were favorable under the federal tax uh, rules that uh, were adopted last uh, March in the CARES Act. They have no impact on uh, Connecticut taxation because uh, Connecticut just follows your federal adjusted gross income, and both of these changes uh, come into play after the, the determination of federal adjusted gross income. So the, these two changes um, will not impact the determination of your uh, Connecticut tax liability. And, and then finally, the um, depreciation of qualified improvement property, the, the, this is um, primarily in, in improvement to real estate and what this uh, provision did, and this is something that was adopted later in, in 2020, in the, I believe in this December of 2020, it uh, enhanced the depreciation, or at least confirmed the depreciation life of qualified improvement property it, to, down to 15 years from what was 39 years under the 2017 Act. So you, instead of depreciating qualified improvement property under 39 years, you, you get it under 15 years. And, and that 15 year depreciation is picked up by Connecticut that you'll get the same benefit in Connecticut. What, what you don't get in Connecticut, and, and this really isn't a, a change in policy because it's been in place certainly um, for many years, is that on the bonus depreciation side, uh, corporations do not get bonus depreciation in, in Connecticut and individuals, uh, you have to add back your depreciation, but add back your bonus depreciation and then spread it out over four years. Um, the, the, if your depreciation changes because of the accelerated depreciation of qualified improvement property over 15 years instead of 39, and it impacts your federal bonus depreciation, you'll have to make a, a change at the Connecticut level because of the fact Connecticut does not recognize in full the, the bonus depreciation. Hey, Lou, one, one correction. Um, yep. This came through as part of the CARES Act. It was a retroactive fix to a technical issue that was in TCJA. They just screwed it up and accidentally made qualified improvement property, 39-year property by mistake in TCJA. And this is finally fixing it. They've been trying for years to get it fixed. Uh, As a result of that, though, that means that some taxpayers were amending or changing in 41A adjustments or doing kind of accounting method changes for 18 and 19. So just think through what you're doing federally and the implications. If you're doing 41A adjustments, if you did 41A adjustments related to this, to your point about bonus, it's still a depreciation adjustment, even though it's coming through as a 41A, again, accounting method change. And you have to think through the mechanics of that. And last but not least, this is... um, 
this is chaos across all the states because there are various levels of conformity to the code, various levels of conformity to bonus. So obviously, you know, this is why Lou and I have jobs is because it's not simple. Uh, and so, you know, we'll, we're seeing various levels of decoupling recoupling and adjustments to think through, not only on the QIP, but we didn't even talk about 163J, which for other states is an implication. So, but in the essence of time, I know we don't have a ton of time left. Perhaps yeah. we should move on to the next slide. Yeah, I, be, be, before we leave, I, I, I do remember the, the glitch in the 2017 TC, TCJA. We all knew they meant 15 years. The statute said 39, and, and the question was, could you take an accounting position or a return position of 15 years? And, and mm -hmm. again, very difficult decision to make since the statute said 39, notwithstanding the legislative intent was otherwise. Next slide. Okay, I, I, I thought it would be, uh, Robin, I thought it'd be useful just to give you a brief update here on the status of Connecticut's estate tax exemption. You know, Connecticut is one of the states that has an estate tax and um, the, the estate tax exemption has uh, been increasing over the last several years. Uh, mo most recently, um, the exemption increased to 7.1 million for this year, 2021, which still is less than the federal exemption, which I believe is 11.7 million for 2021. Uh, and it's scheduled to go to 9.1 million per individual for 2022. And, and the, the, the point of this slide is just to be aware that there, there's obviously um, discussions in Washington about significantly reducing the federal exemption. And if the federal exemption is reduced, that will have an impact in Connecticut because uh, in 2023 and thereafter, Connecticut follows the, the federal ex exemption. We, we could have a very interesting situation if, if there is legis tax legislation that reduces the federal exemption to 20 in 2022, you, you could have a, the unusual situation of the Connecticut exemption being higher than the federal, although one would think that the legislature in Connecticut would just roll it back to the federal, who knows. But, but then you've got the, um, the, the other thing to be aware of is, is that because beginning in 2023, the exemption in Connecticut is tied to the federal exclusion. I believe in 2025, if nothing else happens, the federal exemption automatically reverts back to uh, where it was in 2017, which was the 5 million. So uh, you, you've got the 9.1 million in 2022, 23 and 24, and then you're gonna revert back to 5 million if, if no legislation happens at the federal level. So. Again, this is something um, that, that you need to keep an eye on. And there's been a lot of um, discussion with clients about uh, making gifts to take advantage of these large uh, exemptions uh, with the thought that, they, that this may be a one-shot opportunity to get that benefit. Next slide. So residencies, uh, residency issues and considerations. So we kind of highlighted this a little bit in our discussion in some of the previous slides. Um, but from a big point, what we've seen obviously with COVID-19 and the pandemic is uh, you can work anywhere for a lot of people, right? Obviously, if you work on a factory floor and you're assembling things, you need to be at a location. But if you're doing a service, such as maybe you're a tax accountant, such as myself or Lou, right? Perhaps you can not necessarily have to be in your office. You can work from your home. Perhaps you can work from a mobile home and you're traveling around the country. We have staff that have relocated to different cities. So as a result of that, what we found is that, you know, our work life can be more mobile than it previously was. What that leads to is kind of a lot of things for us to think about going forward, not only from a standpoint of residency and what that means to the individuals and what the residency state is, but for our clients and taxpayers, you know, what does that mean for their tech, uh, nexus and their taxability? Uh, say you're an S corporation that's historically only filed in Connecticut because you have 86272 production because you sell widgets, right? Well, now you have a bunch of employees that are doing, you know, R&D or back office services in say Florida or Texas or Arizona, or maybe they like to ski. So it's Arizona and Colorado or California. The point is, is that, you know, with what's happening to our clients uh, is we're seeing that they're, you know, kind of their 
taxability and their connection to the states is increasing. Uh, you know, and we obviously had to deal with Wayfair and the implications of Wayfair for income tax be, before this. But for most of our clients now, remote workforce is something to think about. And that leads to, well, what is the, you know, the longstanding rules around the convenience of the employer mean, right? Yeah. You have New York and Connecticut's issues, right, that they've been fighting uh, and what those implications will be going forward. And obviously the Massachusetts issue with New Hampshire that's up at the Supreme Court, where just recently the Department of Justice has said that they don't uh, intend to file anything on it, that they don't really think the court should look at this. So, you know, to be determined what the implications will that be. Uh, and as I mentioned, today is the day in Massachusetts that the governor's order is no longer in effect. And so if you read New Hampshire's guidance, 90 days from today is when they're going to waive all the extensions and uh, previous grace periods around filing in the state. And you're going to have nexus and withholding and the telework rules going to apply. Uh, and last but not least, before I kind of turn it over to you for some comments, Lou, is that, you know, we need to think about what it means to be temporary versus permanently relocated. I had a client reach out and, and talk to me and say, hey, uh, we're hearing rumors that HR wants to give people kind of a two week grace period, that if they want to work anywhere for two weeks, they can which is fine for the individual employer, uh, but it creates uh, an employee, but it creates a bunch of questions around payroll. Right. Some states have one day rules that if you're in a state, you have to do one day to do unemployment. I mean, a withholding reporting. You have, again, the nexus issues. If I let people work there, it's not related to a conference. You could create nexus in those uh, jurisdictions. So uh, there's been just some discussions to propose uh, federal legislation to fix this. But uh, given the inability to get any federal legislation out or very limited federal legislation out, I wouldn't hang my you know, hat mm -hmm. on that hook of actually getting accomplished because they've been talking about mobile workforce for at least a decade. So yeah. Lou, I'll pause there for a second to see if you have some comments. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Rob, that, that was excellent. Um, I, I, th I think one of the issues on the mobility trends, especially for 2020, is the issue of statutory residency. Uh, you know, in, in Connecticut, the personal income tax applies either if you're considered a, a resident of Connecticut, meaning you're domiciled in Connecticut, or if you're what's known as, as a statutory resident of Connecticut. And, and, and the statutory residency test is, is a bright line test. It's an, it's an objective test, not a subjective test. And, and you're a Connecticut statutory resident if you have a permanent place of abode in Connecticut and you're in Connecticut for more than 180 days. And, and so um, what happened in 2020 is that many folks in New York uh, specifically who had summer homes in um, in Litchfield County, Connecticut, or on the shore in Connecticut, uh, left their New York City home and may have been in Connecticut uh, at their summer retreat for over 180 days. Uh, and, and we've got several calls from those folks and their accountants as to whether or not there's any COVID-19 exception to that statutory residency status. Uh, they, they didn't intend to be in Connecticut for more than 180 days, but out of necessity, they, they were. And uh, the, the um, word we're getting back from Department of Revenue Services at, at the moment is, is that the statutory residency rules do apply and, and you've got to take them into account uh, that there's no, uh, literally there's no uh, statutory exception for those folks. And, and so uh, again, I, I think, um, Day count is going to be very important for 2020 uh, under Connecticut's day count rules. If you're in Connecticut for one minute, that counts as, as a day in Connecticut. And so if you were in Connecticut for more than 180 days uh, during 2020 and uh, have a permanent place of abode, then you might be subject to tax in 2020 uh, as a stat resident um, subject to uh, tax on, on all your income. With, with respect to the, um, the employment tax withholding, uh, again, we, we touched on this earlier. Uh, the, the issue is whether out-of-state employers who, who now have you know, remote workers in Connecticut uh, need, to, need to assess whether uh, they need to withhold income taxes. And it's not just a withholding of income taxes. The question is, if, if they're doing business in Connecticut because of the fact of the remote employee in Connecticut, that leads to a whole host of other, other issues. Uh, do they have to register as a foreign uh, company with the Connecticut Secretary of State because they're transacting business? 
Do they have to register with the Department of Revenue Services? Uh, do they have to uh, pay unemployment insurance? Uh, do they have to register with the Department of Labor? Uh, th these are all the types of issues that a lot of our out-of-state employers are, are asking us, and I'm sure Rob, Rob is getting the same thing uh, as to, to Massachusetts. So uh, it, I, I think we're just seeing the, the front end of these issues, and, and these issues are going to just more explode as we get uh, fur further along, uh, and the remote workforce uh, takes takes more effect. The punchline, and then we should move on to pastor before we run out of time real quick, is that it, you know you and the tax department, you and the operations, everybody should be talking to each other about what you want to do as a business and the overall implications. And we as tax advisors, my, our role is just simply to give guidance. If you do X, here's the things to think about the cost, right? And it's not necessarily my role, uh, at least I don't view it as, is to tell you how to do your business. I'm here to advise you, if you do this, here's the implications of it. Uh, so Lou, we've got about three minutes left. Do we want to kind of jump to slide 20, Molly, and cover the pastor entity tax at a high level? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So uh, I, I like to refer to the pass-through entity tax as a good tax. And, and somebody who's been practicing tax law for over 40 years, I, I seldom come across a good tax. But the pass-through entity tax is a good tax. And this is something where Connecticut was the leader in the country. And again, you, you got to give uh, kudos and a shout out to the, the DRS and the governor's office, which adopted uh, the pet tax in um, 2018. As soon as uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was adopted at the end of 2017, and as a part of that 2017 adoption of the TCJA, uh, we are all familiar with, with the fact that that act limited the amount of state and local tax uh, deductions that anybody can take to $10,000. The so-called SALT deduction was limited to $10,000. So uh, Connecticut came up with this very creative workaround to the $10,000 limitation. And the, the way the workaround was uh, rolled out is that any pass-through entity, meaning an LLC or a two-person a two-person LLC or more, a partnership, an S corporation, would pay tax to Connecticut on its Connecticut source income. That tax paid by the entity would be a business expense, which would reduce the taxable income of the entity. That's where you get the benefit of the SALT deduction that is capped at the $10,000 level at the individual level, but there's no cap at the business level. So you would pay the tax at the business entity level, you get the deduction, the lower income would flow through to the individuals, and then the individuals would also get a tax credit for the tax paid at the entity level. This is one of those things I, that's probably easier to illustrate with a specific chart, but believe me, it, it works and, and it has been terrific. It, um, for pass-through entities, there's been uh, a, a, a very nice uh, benefit to the ability to take state and local tax deduction in effect over the $10,000. The problem or issue that everybody had with the SALT deduction workaround, the pet tax, was whether or not the IRS would allow taxpayers at the pass-through entity level to take the business expense deduction. If, if the IRS were to rule that the business expense deduction of the pet tax was basically an expense deduction that the entity was paying on behalf of the individual, then the IRS could basically deny the deduction at the entity level. And if the IRS denied the deduction at the entity level, then that would eviscerate the whole purpose of the pet tax itself. And uh, until uh, the end of 2020, we really didn't know how the IRS would come out on that. In fact, um, I, I gave seminars in 2018 or, and 2019 where I was approached by accountants who told me they absolutely were not going to take the pet expense deduction because they felt uncomfortable that the IRS would not allow it. Well, lo and behold, at the end of 2020, in November 2020, um, Connecticut got a nice gift from the Internal Revenue Service. The IRS announced uh, in November by special notice that it was not going to challenge the deduction of the pass-through entity, by, pass entity tax by uh, pass-through entities. Uh, again, terrific news. 
Uh, Connecticut was a leader in the country on this. Uh, and as a result of the IRS news that the pet tax works, basically, uh, you're going to see a number of other states, they've already started, uh, including New York and Massachusetts, uh, adopt their own form of pet tax. Uh, Connecticut is, is unique in the country in that Connecticut's pet tax is mandatory. Um, it is the only state in the country where the pet tax is mandatory. All of the other states have it as optional. Um, I, I love talking about this topic, but I'm going to respect our time. We're at 10.03. And uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. And Rob, it's a pleasure talking with you. Pleasure talking to you. One comment on this as we wrap is just remember that not all of these are created equal. We're seeing some uncertainty around the credit mechanism. So absolutely check your credit mechanism in each state to make sure that taxes paid in other state are deductible or creditable against their tax. So just keep that in the back pocket. Maybe we can have a presentation on that in the future. <laughs> right. And with that, we really appreciate your time. Molly, back over to you. Actually, uh, guys, uh, I, I really appreciate you, uh, you, you stopping uh, the presentation. Uh, that's very unfortunate, though, because uh, the information you were providing is, is, was absolutely uh, fantastic. But just two real quick questions for you. Um, you, you ended perfectly on, on the pass-through entity tax, um, and, and you talked about um, some of the recent great news that Connecticut received. Um, with the new administration in the White House, do you think there is uh, some chance that those caps uh, would be removed? Well, it's not in the uh, the Green Book that uh, came out a month ago, um, which sort of is indicative of, of what the tax uh, proposal is of the White House. The Green Book did not have anything in there about removing the $10,000 cap. So at this point, uh, I, I'd say it's probably unlikely, although all the, all the politicians in the Northeast uh, clearly favor it. The other thing I would say is, is that the limitation by its terms is going to be lifted in 2025. So the question, you know, we're, we're 2021, do, do they remove the limitation, will, which will be a budgetary hit at the Fed side, uh, reduce taxes, uh, excuse me, yeah, reduce taxes, or do they just wait till 2025? Rob? And on, on top of that, what they may do, what you've heard rumblings is not to eliminate the elimination, but to raise the cap, right? Yep. So if they go from 10 to 20, that would cover most taxpayers. And those that it doesn't cover would get covered through the pass-through entity piece of it. So even if they were to extend the limitation, uh, they may be through a higher cap. So at the end of the day, it's, you know, they, there's a lot of sausage to be made in DC yet. Yeah. Uh, we're just at the beginning phase of it. So we'll have to wait to see how that sausage turns out. And if I, if I could just one, add one more point, when Connecticut's pet tax was adopted, it was intended to be revenue neutral. And uh, that lasted through the end of 2018. Uh, in, in 2019, uh, they reduced the amount of credit that you got at the individual level, which turned the pet tax into a revenue raiser. It generated $50 million. In, and so I, I suspect that the pet tax is here for with us to stay even when the SALT limitation is uh, removed in 2025. Um, final question, and you touched on uh, this uh, early in your presentation. Um, you know, one trend that seemed to appear in multiple states this year is that proposed digital ad tax. Um, and I hate to give the other side any ideas, but you know, what are some of the other trends that we should be watching for in Connecticut related to tax policy? Um, I mean, you've already gone combined. You've already gone market-based sourcing, right? So and, we, and we've already uh, gone seeing, Wayfair. Yeah, exactly. So you've kind of used all your chips. You're yeah. left to new taxes or to increase the tax rates, at least from a corporate taxpayer. Another trend could be is people are talking about worldwide combined. Right. People are talking about the implications of federally I'm guilty and whether or not they should follow that. Again, things that Connecticut has addressed, but doesn't mean it couldn't be addressed again. So there are things for us to be thinking about um, as we look at other states and what they're doing. But you're kind of a trendsetter. You've already kind of gone for some of those things. So you're left with limited you know, areas in which to tweak. You may have to go more digital taxes and things like that as to be real revenue raisers. The thing I would, would not discount is that payroll tax. Uh, I, I know that has a lot of strong support up at the legislature and uh, we, we may see um, the payroll tax uh, come back in, in play next session again. And I would last comment is I definitely pay attention to what's happening with the Biden proposals because obviously what happens there 
impacts the state. Now, again, think about all the guilty changes they're talking about federally. Those guilty changes will have limited impact because you're only taxing 5% in Connecticut, but perhaps they say, hey, this is money we're leaving on the table. Let's change it from 95% deduction to 80% or something, right? Because you look around the country and there are a lot of states that have 80% DRDs and they may just try to ratchet that down to you know add a little bit more cash on the pile. Well, Robert and Lou, uh, thank you both for your time, your expertise, and your many insights today. Uh, PwC and Shipman and Goodwin are both CBIA member companies, and we really appreciate your continued engagement and support. So for everyone online, uh, we will be right back following uh, this short break uh, and continue on with our property tax panel. So thank you again, both of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone from that short break. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to have a terrific group of experts with us this morning to address property taxes and valuations. You will hear first from Pullman and Conley member in property tax and valuation and department chair, uh, Greg Servididio, followed by KPMG partner, Joseph Hanley and firm principals, David Agrilla, Patrick Fury and manager, Matt Burns at 1115. Greg, good morning. Good morning, thank you, Eric, and good morning, everybody. Uh, as Eric mentioned, um, I'm an attorney at the firm of Pullman & Comley. I chair our firm's property tax and valuation department, and I'm delighted to be here with you this morning to talk about property tax issues, along with my friends from KPMG. And uh, with the able assistance of Molly at CBIA, we'll move through some of the slides that I prepared. I thought it would be helpful to just give the uh, group a quick overview of property taxation in Connecticut. So the first question always is, uh, what types of property are subject to property tax here in the state? And on, on my first slide, you'll see a listing of essentially all property is subject to tax unless specifically exempt by statute. Uh, so that would be real estate, business personal property, and motor vehicles. Uh, the two that we'll focus on most over the course of the presentation will be uh, obviously real estate and business personal property. If we can move to the next slide, Molly. And then one more, actually two more beyond that. Uh, so what are the principles of valuation here in Connecticut? Uh, all property, whether it's real or personal, is to be valued based on a fair market value basis. And the, the traditional uh, definition of, of fair market value that's employed in Connecticut is um, the one that many of you have seen. Uh, for those of you who work in the area, who've reviewed appraisal reports, et cetera, it's the willing buyer, willing seller, neither party under duress, et cetera. That, that definition is the one that's employed and it's employed uh, both for real and personal property. Now, of course, in Connecticut, um, uh, it's worth noting at this point that real estate is valued every five years. Personal property is valued annually. Uh, real estate is valued typically on a mass appraisal basis by a municipality as part of a revaluation. Personal property, again, the standard still being fair market value, but personal property is often valued based on the personal property declaration that's filed by the taxpayer. And we'll spend time later in my segment of the program talking about specifically about personal property issues when I've spoken uh, on behalf of the CBIA in the past, uh, typically at the fall uh, property tax and fixed asset workshop, there always seems to be a high level of interest in personal property issues. So we will spend some additional time on personal property. 
In arriving at fair market value, there are three recognized approaches for doing so. Uh, I'm, I won't spend a lot of time on this now. The KPMG team will delve into this further, but I do list here on slide four, uh, the three basic approaches to value that are well recognized here in Connecticut. And they are the cost approach, uh, starting with either replacement or reproduction costs, and then making deductions for depreciation and obsolescence to arrive at market value. The income capitalization approach. This is the one that you typically see with income producing property where an income stream is typically capitalized to produce a, an indication of value as of a particular date. And then comparable sales uh, for those who have bought and sold homes and, and reviewed residential appraisals. Uh, this is the approach that you typically see in that context using the sales of comparable properties to ascertain the value of the subject property through a process of identification and, and adjustment. And again, we'll be touching on these concepts throughout the property tax um, portion of the program. On the next slide, slide five, I talk about value in exchange. And, and, and this is important. There, in the property tax realm, um, there, there are different types of value that can be discussed. Uh, value in exchange, which again ties to the fair market value definition, is the one that really uh, should be predominant in those discussions. You sometimes do hear discussions about other types of value like value in use, value to a particular user, uh, but it is value in exchange, the willing buyer, willing seller uh, operating with uh, good information and, and reaching a price in, in, a, in the market where the property is exposed and eventually transacts. We do have a, a statute in Connecticut that um, prohibits the use of what's called a forced or auction sale in the estimation of fair market value. And I find this statute particularly interesting in the current environment that we've been in, because when, obviously when the statute was written uh, years ago, the intention of it was to deal with things like uh, foreclosure transactions, things of that nature, where say a lender took back property uh, because it was in distress. Now, of course, we're dealing with a, a phenomenon that we're, we're seeing played out almost daily where properties are sold or offered for sale through a, um, an auction process in an effort to raise uh, the largest amount of revenue for, um, for the sale of the asset. So I've had some interesting conversations with assessors around these types of uh, transactions because there may be circumstances where an auction sale might actually produce the highest value that an asset can achieve. So in my personal view, this uh, statute, um, you know, it's, it's, it's um, bedrock to assessors but it's something that uh, I think to me has lost some relevance in the current environment. And certainly talking about, uh, in dealing with assessors, talking about an auction process, uh, there's no harm in doing it. Um, uh, but just be aware of that statute as an impediment to uh, potentially basing an appeal uh, solely on an on a auction transaction. Um, I mentioned uh, real property being valued based on uh, a five-year revaluation cycle. And the value is tied to the base year. So uh, you'll see upcoming in my slides, a list of the communities that are slated to reval this year, October 1, 2021. And the values that are set as of that date in those communities stay on the grand list 
for not only the first year, the base year, but also the four subsequent years. And that the fact that we revalue every five years in Connecticut, which when you look across the country tends to be one of the longer revaluation cycles that you see, uh, makes for some very interesting conversations around what's happened with um, COVID's impact on real estate values over the last year and a half. Because a municipality is, is faced with uh, the situation where if they make a, a sizable reduction in a value based on COVID factors, then that's a, a value they may have to live with for five years when uh, hopefully the situation for the property may improve in the future. So uh, over the last year or so, I've had some interesting conversations with assessors who have shared their view about the permanent versus transitory nature of some of the trends that we've observed uh, during the pandemic as they impact uh, commercial real estate and whether they are in fact uh, permanent trends, permanent shifts, or just merely transitory blips and how, the, how, how that should be taken into account in setting values for real estate. Um, personal property valued uh, annually, valued based on the personal property declaration using uh, historical cost, less provided depreciation factors. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but again, for those of you who have filled out personal property declaration forms, you're familiar with what I'm Speaking of, the form, which is due by November 1st of each year, requires the owner to rep report the historical acquisition cost plus freight and installation costs of the particular assets being declared. And then the forms, uh, I'll say, suggests or provides depreciation tables, which the taxpayer is invited to apply to the historical cost to produce quote unquote fair market value. Now, uh, there are many situations that I think we can all conjure up where that kind of an approach might not capture the physical depreciation, the functional obsolescence, certainly the economic obsolescence impacting particular pieces of personal property. Uh, it's sort of a one size fits all approach. So I'll talk to you in a little bit about some tips for bringing forward uh, issues or concerns around personal property values uh, in connection with completion of personal property declarations. On my next slide, slide six, um, just to cover some basics, of course, October 1st in the property tax realm here in Connecticut is an important date. Although I've always found it interesting that when October 1st comes, nothing really happens. <laughs> it's a date, it's a date in, that in our area, we obviously take note of because it is the lien date. It's the date on which the value of property is established, but it's not like uh, January 1st or something like that where there's something exciting going on. Uh, it's a date that comes and, and goes. Uh, but it is our lien date, the date we need to uh, always be cognizant of. With regard to personal property declarations, uh, uh, many of you uh, finished filing those by November 1st of, of last year for um, 10 one twenty. And um, I won't go into detail here, but I provide some information in the slides about um, some tips in making sure that the filing is uh, timely. One of, the, one of the challenges, and again, in speaking with clients and contacts I have across the country, one of the challenges in Connecticut is the very short period of time between the lien date and the date your personal property declaration is due, only a month and how difficult it can be for companies to pull the information together in that very short period of time. 
and using October 1st as a lien date, which may not have a lot of uh, significance uh, within the record keeping of any particular company. So um, there are opportunities which we'll discuss to seek extensions of that. Um, I touch on this on slide seven of the uh, presentation where you can seek an extension uh, of up to 45 days to file your personal property uh, declaration. Uh, you do need to request that extension in advance of the filing deadline uh, to make sure that it can be granted. Uh, and again, on slide seven, I have some tips for um, how to deal with that. Uh, one thing I, I mentioned here at the bottom of slide seven is uh, the, the, the concept of an estimated return uh, followed up by an amended return. Uh, this is a question that typically comes up in our, in our personal property uh, workshops that we put on for CBIA. So I thought it was worth something mentioning here. And the, the question I typically get asked is, can you amend a personal property declaration once it's been filed? Uh, particularly in light of that, that compressed time period that we've talked about. And obviously the, the best practice would be to, um, if you do need additional time to try to get that extension. Um, assessor, it's, it's not um, a given. It's not, it's not something you could definitely count on getting. Uh, assessors fall in three camps. Those that give them routinely and without any uh, grief. Uh, the second camp would be those that give them, but not for the full 45 day period. And then the third uh, camp that um, people fall in, and there's a group of assessors who simply will not um, uh, provide them and will require you to file in the best um, shape you can by November 1st and then file an amended uh, return. I suggest at the bottom of slide seven that um, if you are in need of amending the return to do so as soon as you can after the, the original filing is made, but uh, you know certainly before the end of the calendar year. And I say this because the assessor has until January 31st to sign his or her grand list for the preceding October 1. And if you wait to file that amended return until a date close to the date she's filing, she's signing the grand list. Um, there's really no time uh, to uh, allow the assessor to review the amended return and make whatever adjustments uh, might be warranted. So my advice is if you do need to file, but you're, you're aware that there's still information that that you're trying to gather or organize, file the best you can, inform the assessor that you will be amending the return um, if you can't get that extension, and then file the amended return as, as quickly as you can after the deadline. And always, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in communication, so I always suggest that uh, the client, the property owner, pick up the phone and call the assessor and let them know what's coming. And when it's filed, follow up to see if there are any questions about what's been submitted. Um, a number of disputes that eventually emerge and, and land on my desk as an attorney um, could have been either avoided or perhaps um, ameliorated to some extent by better communication. Some assessors are very good. They'll be proactive. They'll pick up the phone and call you if there's a question, uh, but um, don't count on that. And in, in many cases, it might behoove you to, to um, reach out to them to make sure that um, They've received everything and, and there are no lingering questions. And that's particular, I think particularly true if there are some big changes 
that are that have occurred in a declaration. So when a personal property declaration is filed with an assessor, one of the first things they'll do is compare it to the one filed in the prior year to see what has changed. And there is a reconciliation on the form, which does help the assessor identify what changes have occurred from the prior year to the current year. Uh, but they'll be looking to see, are, are there big, was there a big acquisition? Was there a big disposition? Are the numbers consistent from last year to this year? Just moved down on the depreciation tables? Or are there some variations? And the easiest way to get a personal property declaration flagged for further attention is for there to be an unexplained large uh, divergence between what was filed in a prior year and what's filed this year. So certainly a great example of this is um, dispositions. Um, many companies that I deal with have re uh, records that are in varying states of, of um, currentness and completeness. And there comes a time where uh, ghost assets are identified assets that have been on a fixed asset register for years that haven't been in the plant for years, were sold, were scrapped, and yet the records just never caught up with the reality of what was going on on site. Um, at some point, that gets cleaned up, and then there's a big disposition that's showing or a big variance that's showing on your personal property declaration. And again, that's, that's a great way for a red flag to pop up in the assessor's office. And to get ahead of that, giving the assessor either with the declaration or in a phone call or whatever, the heads up that, hey, look, we've, we've been cleaning up our records. We did a physical inventory. We noticed we had a number of ghost assets. They've been removed. So you will be seeing a, um, a significant disposition in the filing this year. This is the explanation. This is what we did. This is how we did it. Do you wanna come out and look at the property to verify that that's been done, things of that nature. And again, I find that that communication um, can help avoid aggravation on down the road. Um, Moving on to slide eight, the only thing I'll mention here is um, municipalities have been given the ability to accept electronically filed personal property declarations for quite a while. Um, uh, a lot of them are still not uh, doing that. And that's, that's disappointing. It, it obviously puts a lot of burden on taxpayers to make sure that these filings are oftentimes physically in the possession of the municipality um, or you know, put in the mail. Whereas an electronic filing um, would certainly expedite things from the, the uh, business standpoint. But uh, we're, we're seeing more with regard to the filing of income and expense forms, which Many of you may have just completed as of June 1st. That's another annual filing obligation of, of businesses in Connecticut to file their income and expense statements for income producing property for the preceding calendar year by June 1st of the next year. Uh, many of you have just completed that process. We're seeing more and more municipalities accepting that information electronically and the, the filing of uh, personal property declarations seems to have lagged that um, a bit. Moving on to slide nine, just, I think uh, most of us know this, but just uh, particularly out of state property owners uh, uh, sort of have a hard time understanding when taxes are due and to what brand last year they relate. So I, I always put this in just to help everybody understand that um, using this example, grand list October 1, 2020, taxes due the following July and January in two payment towns. 
and we do have some four payment towns in the juris in the state, uh, handful of jurisdictions who do issue bills uh, for, uh, quarterly. Um, another thing, out-of-state property owners uh, sometimes don't hone in on quickly is the fact that Connecticut has a 70% assessment ratio. So when you get an assessment notice, when you get a tax bill, the number you're seeing on those documents is actually expressed at 70% of fair market value, FMV. And again, fair market value we discussed at the outset um, is the 100% the value, what, what the property would sell for, willing buyer, willing seller, et cetera. Um, 70% is our assessment ratio. Again, people always ask me, how did that come to pass? And there are many apocryphal stories. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it came to pass. I can tell you that it is somewhat unusual to have an assessment ratio below 100% across the country. And uh, it does create confusion unfortunately, on the part of taxpayers, because they, they might get a bill or a notice and see a value and say, oh, well, that's something I think is, I can live with, uh, only to find out uh, that no, that's 70% of fair market. And um, so I always, well, I'm sure most of you know that, just always uh, think it important to point that out. And then of course, the tax on any particular value is calculated by applying the 70% ratio as well as the mill rate established by the local jurisdiction to include any special services districts that the property might be located in. And we're seeing more and more of these districts being created in Connecticut. So there's an additional millage that many properties are subject to. Uh, they could be related to um, business improvement districts, uh, fire districts, uh, utility districts, uh, things of that nature. Uh, moving on to slide 10. Uh, I think we've covered um, uh, much of this uh, information already. The fact that real estate revalued every five years, there is an, a requirement in Connecticut that assessors are obligated to go out and physically inspect property at least every 10 years. So you can have um, a physical, what, what's colloquially referred to as a physical inspection at one point in time, and then five years later, it might be more of what can be referred to as a statistical revaluation without the necessity of coming out and inspecting uh, properties in person. Um, I always recommend to my clients that if asked for access that they provide it. Um, it's a way of ensuring an accurate assessment. And certainly if there's, if you find yourself in an appeal position vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular uh, town, if you've denied access to the assessor to get into your property, that's that will negatively impact uh, your ability to successfully uh, pursue an appeal. So that's, that's an important thing to remind folks of. Uh, we're seeing more and more assessors using data mailers to assist with the gathering of information. And we saw that uh, last year with the pandemic, uh, there was um, somewhat more use of the data mailers um, these are uh, mailed out ahead of revaluations to businesses. They're designed to, again, try to make sure that the information that the municipality has about a particular property is accurate. And um, I would, I definitely encourage people to complete those and return them again for the, really for the two reasons I mentioned. Uh, number one, uh, you want to make sure that the assessor has accurate information about your property. And number two, uh, if you do find yourself in an appeal posture, better to have supplied the information than, than not have. And, you know, view things like, 
I always ask or suggest to my clients that they view these, these filing obligations um, as opportunities for communication. So whether it's the uh, personal property declaration, whether it is the um, income and expense form, or whether it is uh, a data mailer like the one we're discussing, um, it's a way of communicating if there are issues with a property, it's an opportunity to communicate information to the assessor so that can be taken into account when the value is next established. So um, I'd suggest think about these documents a little more expansively. They, they can be a chore, they can be burdensome, uh, but they could also be an opportunity for you to point out that, hey, look, um, you know, the property's experiencing some significant vacancy. Uh, we have some deferred maintenance issues, things of that nature, which uh, it would be important for the assessor to, to be aware of. I mentioned at the, at the bottom here of slide 10, uh, revaluations of real estate may be good news for business personal property if the mill rate is reduced. Um, in the old days, um, I won't date myself about how old those days were, but um, we would often see when there was a reval in a community, uh, the grand list would increase significantly and the mill rate would drop significantly. Because again, there you need so much money to, to run the town. And if your grand list, if you've experienced significant grand list growth, you can still balance the budget by using a lower mill rate. Uh, that phenomenon is not as apparent now. Uh, over the last number of years, upon reval, we're not seeing um, uniformly, at least, these large increases in grand list. So we're not seeing large decreases in mill rate. So for those of you who may be doing budgeting for taxes and maybe coming up on a, on a reval, um, probably best to be a little more conservative in how you, you budget uh, where a mill rate might go. And I would not, um, as a general proposition, anticipate a huge drop in a mill rate when you see a, a, a reval occur. Moving on to slide 11. Um, this has always been a subject of discussion, a lot of discussion at, um, at our uh, fixed asset workshops over the years. What, you know, what is considered to be real property versus personal property? And again, the advantage of classifying something as personal property is it's revalued annually and therefore subject to increasing amounts of depreciation year over year. Whereas to treat something as real estate locks you in to a value at a base year for five years, that value does not change in spite of what might be going on in the market, what might be going on with the property in particular. Once you're locked into that uh, base year value on the real estate side, that's your value for five years, regardless of changes in, in market, for example. So the conventional wisdom is it's better to try to classify things as personal property uh, in many circumstances versus real estate. Um, some examples here uh, from past programs uh, have been supplied as to what assessors generally consider to be real property. And real property will be reflected on what's called a property record card or a field card. So if you go down, many of them are, are online or if you go down to town hall and ask for the property record card or field card for your property, which by the way, is always a good idea to do, particularly upon revaluation when they're setting a new value to again, ensure that the data is accurate. 
Uh, when you go down and pick up a copy or go online and pick up a copy of your property record card, you can see exactly what the assessor is treating as real estate and the value that he or she is ascribing to the different components of real estate, typically building, land, and site improvements. Uh, the, the one thing I will mention to you is that the online versions of property record cards often don't contain the level of detail that you will find if you go into town hall and pick up a copy of your property record card in person from the assessor's office. So I do suggest where, where that's possible to do that because you will see typically a lot more information displayed and will be able to determine uh, accuracy of what they have listed as far as amount of uh, land, as far as um, uh, acreage, uh, uh, building area, building amenities, things of that nature. Let's go to the next slide, slide 12. Leasehold improvements is always a subject of, of um, debate, uh, whether it's real or personal. And I know it, it looks like we've had uh, a question posed about uh, solar installations, whether they're real or personal property. And that's a great, <laughs> that's actually a great and very timely question from one of our participants because um, I will I actually will touch at the end on um, a piece of legislation that was passed that impacts uh, residential uh, solar. Um, but you know solar is a good example of whether it's treated as part of the real estate and when I say solar solar panels, whether it's treated as part of the real estate or, or personal property. Uh, personally, I think uh, the best way to treat so solar panels is as personal property. I think that's the way they're often treated, um, but I have occasionally seen them treated as uh, real estate as well. One thing, and this, this ties in on slide 12, you see this and it ties into the comment I made about um, uh, looking at your property record card is the whole issue of double taxation. So if you're debating whether or not something should be treated as real or personal property, what the best way is to classify it, uh, always good to start with the property record card to see what is included. Because obviously you want to avoid a double assessment. If, if the assessor is treating, if the assessor has made the decision to treat your solar panels as part of the real estate and is shown as a site improvement or an, a building amenity on your property record card, then obviously you wanna make sure it's not also being declared by you as personal property on your personal property declaration. So looking at the, at the record card will allow you to determine what is and is not included and can help you grapple with the, the classification issue of whether something is real or personal property. Moving on to slide 13, I've, again, this is based on uh, prior programs. Uh, just some of the gray areas that people have brought up over time as, as to whether something is real or, or business personal property, that's BPP. Um, the point I just made is reinforced here about checking the property record card. And sometimes where I've had uh, issues with assessors uh, about whether something should be treated as real or personal property. Sometimes, frankly, the best solution to that is a negotiated one where 
a determination is made or agreed upon between the assessor and the property owner that uh, a certain amount of cost attributable to a particular asset or improvement uh, may be included as part of the real estate assessment with the balance of the cost being treated as business personal property. So say, the point I make at the end is sometimes simply a, a negotiated resolution or a split is the best or perhaps the only way to resolve what would otherwise be a gray area that would you know, trigger a lot of litigation uh, cost to, to try to untangle. Uh, let's move on to uh, the list of revaluation communities upcoming. Uh, 2021 is a year in which there are quite a few revaluations that are anticipated. Those are listed on slide 15. And as you can see, we have the city of Hartford and we have a number of other uh, significant uh, communities. When I say significant, I'm referring to uh, property, uh, uh, communities with significant commercial grand lists um, that are upcoming this year. This, this year, last year, this year, are two of our um, heavier years as far as revaluation activity. So if, you're, if you own commercial property or lease commercial property in, or, or have uh, residential property in any of these communities, you should be aware that uh, they are in the midst of doing a revaluation that um, you may have or may be seeing data mailers, you may have or may be seeing requests for access and um, you most definitely will be seeing notices of your new preliminary assessments coming out in the fall. Typically, we see them, remember the, the, the lien date is October 1st. We typically see them coming out in November and December. And we'll talk a, a little bit more about uh, the process of dealing with those as we um, proceed. Uh, the next set of um, slides beginning at uh, 16 and 17 uh, deal with specifically with manufacturers and the fact that manufacturing machinery and equipment does benefit in Connecticut from exemption, uh, provided it is engaged in, in certain types of activities such as manufacturing, research and development. What's really interesting about this program, many of you may know it as the M65 program, which is what it was been, it's been known as for years. What's interesting about the program is that um, it has changed significantly um, from being a state administered exemption program to a locally administered uh, exemption program. So while there are some uh, definitions, and I, I cite the statutes here that are, that are on the books in, in our uh, Connecticut statutes regarding what types of properties are, are um, entitled to exemption, the administration of the exemptions now has devolved from the state to each individual municipality and uh, the individual assessors. And that's created some challenges because now each individual assessor is tasked with determining whether she or he believes that a particular piece of property is entitled to the exemption or not. And of course, you know, with, with this comes revenue loss. So uh, what I'm seeing in my experience is Whereas when this program uh, years ago was administered by the state, you saw, you tended to see more uniformity. Now what I'm seeing is uh, more variation from town to town in how broadly or narrowly they're interpreting these exemption statutes. Uh, many, many assessors are reaching out to auditors um, to assist them 
in conducting these personal property um, audits, these exemption audits. And um, auditors can have different views, some being more aggressive than others. So we're starting to see, or we have been seeing, I would suggest less uniformity in the way that these issues are being addressed across uh, the state of Connecticut. I would mention that, um, you know, if you do have issues around exemption, whether or not something qualifies, uh, one resource, which I think is still floating around, uh, perhaps on the OPM website, Office of Policy and Management website, are a series of questions and answers that were developed by OPM before they got out of the business of uh, administering the M65 program. Those Q and A's, while somewhat dated now, are still in circulation and are still being looked at by assessors to help them make determinations about whether or not something is entitled to exemption. So beyond looking at the statutes that I've cited, if you, your accountant, or are trying to make some determinations about entitlement to exemption, I would also direct you to the OPM uh, website to see if those uh, FAQs can still be um, accessed. Uh, the information that I just relayed is covered on slide 18. And I think the most important thing to mention on slide 19 is just making sure that you get your exemption form filed annually with the personal property declaration. So with the personal property declaration, there is a, a supplemental form, which is applicable to the code 13 personal property, the property that's entitled to exemption. It's imperative that that form be filled out and submitted with the declaration in order to obtain or maintain the exemption. Without that, uh, there's a good chance you're gonna lose the exemption uh, for that particular year. So that's, that's something that should not be uh, ignored. And I have, a, at, the, at the end of my program, we're gonna talk about some recent legislation or recently passed bills. I'll mention something about this as well. Uh, slide 20 is, what I've been talking about as far as uh, the devolution of the responsibility to administer the program now to 169 municipal assessors uh, throughout the state. So that's created uh, its own set of, of challenges. Um, moving on to slide uh, 21. Um, obviously, if there are any determinations that are made in connection with your personal property assessment, you do have the ability to appeal those. And shortly, we'll be touching on the appeal uh, process uh, just briefly. Slide 22, always uh, in our personal property uh, workshop, always engenders a lot of discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time uh, today to get into all of it, but there's always been a robust discussion of what types of costs uh, do not need to be uh, reported on the personal property declaration. Um, uh, obviously, the, the actual historical cost of the tangible asset does. And uniformly throughout the state of Connecticut, you're obligated to report costs associated with freight and installation on the, as part of the base cost of an asset. Um, one of the big debates that we always have each year is what types of intangible costs that may have shown up on a fixed asset register um, should or should not be declared. Uh, my position is if, if um, you know, you've, you've got some soft costs like um, meals and expenses that somehow got capitalized in connection with the acquisition or installation of, a, of an asset. To me, those are not the types of costs that 
um, relate to the tangible personal property. And that's the obligation in Connecticut is to declare tangible personal property. So uh, I guess my takeaway here is when completing the personal property declaration form, always be cognizant uh, as you're looking through your fixed asset register of what may have gotten placed on there and how it relates, if at all, to the tangible costs of the asset and give some thought to whether it's, um, these are costs, soft costs, intangible costs that are not really called for by the personal property declaration. Uh, once, once it's on there, it, it's a devil of a time to get them taken off. Uh, there are some exemptions that I'll briefly mention that are available. And it's again, it's always good to check whatever exemptions might be available to your, uh, for your personal property. So on slide 23, I just mentioned the software exemption that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, slide 24, water pollution control equipment, uh, air pollution control equipment, entitled to exemption on a self-certifying uh, basis. So consider if your manufacturing process has that kind of equipment, uh, there's an opportunity to seek exemption for that. I also mentioned on slide 25, uh, the fact that there are, if, if you're doing business in certain distressed municipalities, there are tax saving opportunities that are available uh, I happen to mention, Hart mention Hartford, not to call it out specifically, but just as one of uh, a number of distressed pro uh, municipalities in the state where there could be additional property tax exemptions or benefits available to um, particularly to manufacturers. Uh, two more sections uh, in this part of the program. We're gonna to touch briefly on audits and appeals. So slide 27 talks about the right of municipalities to conduct personal property audits. Uh, they can go back up to three years and audit your personal property declarations, uh, requesting books, records, tax returns, and other supporting information. And if they determine that there has been obviously a non-filing or a, an under-reporting of assets. There can be uh, significant penalties um, that could be attended to that uh, to include 25% penalty for omitted property as mentioned on slide 28. Again, under the heading of communication is best, um, Municipalities typically hire auditors to assist them with the audit function. They don't typically do them in-house. So you're dealing with an outside auditor, a contract auditor, and remaining in touch with them. Uh, obviously, uh, if you're gonna have trouble meeting the deadline that they've imposed for submitting information, uh, indicating that you'll need some additional time to do that. Uh, staying in touch, uh, answering questions about the information that you're supplying to help them understand it, uh, requesting a hearing um, uh, with the auditor, uh, if you think that would uh, benefit the communication. Um, and then of course, if you are unhappy with the eventual audit results, they can be appealed to the Board of Assessment Appeals. So with regard to appeals briefly, uh, slide 29, I refer to, often refer to it as three, three bites at the apple, particularly on the real estate side. So when you get that real estate assessment notice in one of those reval communities, sometimes say in November, it will invite you to meet with the revaluation firm or the assessor to talk about any concerns you have concerning the value. This is really the best opportunity for you to get an equitable value because it is a preliminary value. It's not 
on a grand list at this point. You haven't paid taxes on it. So there, uh, I view there to be more flexibility in, in reaching an understanding about an equitable value at this particular juncture. And these informal hearings will, will be occurring in the November, December, January, early January timeframe. If they're unsuccessful, then you have the ability to appeal to the Board of Assessment Appeals uh, in the local municipality. February 20 is the statewide deadline to do that, unless there's been an extension of time granted the municipality to complete its reval, in which case the deadline may move to, to March 20. Um, for the appeal forms typically become available in late January, early February. They need to be filed uh, by the deadline in order for you to preserve your appeal rights. So it's very important to note that deadline on your calendars. And then of course, if the board doesn't grant relief and oftentimes it does not, it gives you that you have the opportunity to take your case to court. That's the so-called third bite at the apple. Um, since we're running low on time, I just show slide 30 uh, to show you the basic information that needs to be put on the appeal form to the Board of Assessment Appeals. Make sure it is the form is complete. You don't want it rejected as being incomplete. And one of the most important aspects of the form is the estimate of value. You can't file a form challenging the assessment of property by just saying it's excessive or too high without providing your own opinion of what the value of the property should be. Um, boards don't necessarily have to give hearings for commercial property uh, assessed at over a million dollars. And we're seeing that happening with more frequency. So on slide 31, I mentioned uh, the ability for them to elect not to conduct a hearing on more significant commercial properties and just deny you and send you right to court. If they do give you a hearing, it'll be held sometime in March. You'll be notified shortly after the determination is made in writing, and then you have two months to file and your appeal to superior court if you are dissatisfied with the outcome. Um, in the few minutes I have left, I'll just briefly mention that there are two appeal statutes uh, that allow you to bring tax appeals. The one that's most commonly used is mentioned on slide 32 under 12-117A. This, is, this uh, statute obligates you to go through the Board of Assessment Appeals and on to court to challenge your assessment. Um, and that's the statute that typically focuses on issues of value. Uh, there is a second appeal statute, which I mentioned on slide 33, referred to as 12119. This statute, uh, the nice thing about it, it has a one year statute of limitations from the assessment date, not that short two month uh, window that I just mentioned. But this statute really is more to, goes more to issues of non-taxability, uh, legal infirmities with the assessment as opposed to just mere overvaluation. And in the few minutes I have left, I just wanted to um, let you know what has come through the General Assembly in uh, the 2021 session with the caveat that um, the implementer bill is, I think Eric just uh, got his hands on it this morning. So we all will be taking a look at it. Uh, this is the bill that implements the budget. And it is not uncommon for property tax measures, uh, some of which have been considered during the regular session, but never found their way through to approval, may have been the subject of a public hearing, but never found their way completely through the process, um, sometimes land in the implementer bill. So it's always uh, a good thing to review that to see what other concepts that you thought might not have uh, made it through 
um, have gotten picked up. But the few that I'm going to highlight now on slide 34, the first public act that was passed out of this session was, it got a lot of press, so you probably heard about it, um, providing for incentives to develop data centers in the state. And among those incentives are certain property tax exemptions and benefits that are available for qualifying data centers that are developed in the state. Um, on the next slide, we have Public Act 2124, which expanded the definition of farmland and maritime heritage land to include aquaculture operations uh, to allow them to enjoy the benefits of PA 490. So, as many of you know, in Connecticut, farmland, forest land, open space land can enjoy beneficial property tax treatment. More recently, that was expanded to include, in, include maritime heritage land and now aquaculture operations, farms underwater. Interesting. Um, for the participant who raised the question about solar, I would direct them to a bill that made it through both houses but has not been signed yet. The first two are public acts, so they've been signed by the governor. The next three have been passed by both houses. Um, you would think they'd be signed by the governor. They could be vetoed, but I thought I would just highlight them anyway so that they're on your radar screen. The first one, uh, 6106, clarifies the eligibility, particularly of residential solar for a property tax exemption. This has been an issue that has been litigated and hotly contested across the state for several years. Um, the meaning of the exemption statute that deals with renewable energy sources and how it applies to residential solar, particularly where the homeowner may not own the solar panel. Um, and with this bill, which may become law, uh, the, there'll be some uniformity, hopefully, and the litigation that's been ongoing will be resolved uh, with some clarity around what, what's exempted. Slide 36, again, a bill that made it through both sessions, not yet signed, picked up on an executive order that Governor Lamont signed during the pandemic, you may recall, um, providing for two programs. One was called the uh, deferral program, one the low interest program, and it gave taxpayers the ability, depending on the program adopted by a municipality, to either defer paying its taxes without penalty for up to 90 days or to defer payment up to 90 days and pay interest at a reduced rate. Uh, those programs were very helpful to a number of taxpayers and they've been now sort of rolled into a bill which has made it through both houses, which would allow similar programs to be adopted by municipalities for the next two fiscal years um, either the deferral or the low interest program. So that, that uh, pandemic related benefit may actually be carried forward in a more formal way uh, over the next two years. And then the final thing I'll mention is the remedial uh, bill that was passed at the very end of the session, 1100. Uh, this happens every year for taxpayers um, that miss statutory deadlines. And the General Assembly kindly passes a bill that allows people to file late property tax exemption applications um, under certain statutes and in certain towns. So again, this hasn't been signed yet, but I did think I, I thought I would call it out to people. Chances are the people who will benefit from it know about it because they probably requested this. But I did identify the bill and the municipalities named. So if you have an issue in one of those, you may wanna check this bill to see if you might, you might fall under it as well if, if a deadline was missed. So with that, I am out of time. I appreciate your time. And we will take a short five minute break, I believe at this point.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Hanley. I'm a tax partner with KPMG. Um, I lead our uh, accounting methods and credits practice for New England and upstate New York. I'm here with a number of my colleagues today, and we're thrilled to be here with you uh, going through a, a bit of material. Um, we're going to talk about uh, some valuation considerations, certainly very important uh, as it relates to property tax. And we're gonna conclude the session with some income tax accounting ramifications of uh, property, uh, particularly real property to think about as you're going through certain property tax considerations. So we have about an hour left in the presentation. Um, and again, we're all very happy to be here today. Um, I'm here with uh, my, my colleague, Matt Burns, who's a, a manager on my team. And I will turn it over to Dave and Pat, who will uh, uh, introduce themselves and, and get started with the, the property tax side of the, the, uh, the presentation. Thank you all for your time. We're, we're very happy to be here. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Patrick Fiore. I'm a partner in KPMG's economic and valuation services practice. And we're going to start with a, a, a high level overview of some property tax base basics. Um, I think Greg in the prior section did a very thorough job of covering a lot of these terms. So really just wanted to, to kind of level set. But the focus of this presentation between myself and, and Dave Aguilera, who will follow me, is going to be more on the valuation side. So thinking about uh, the inputs to, to valuation, uh, both from the standpoint of the assessor, but also from the standpoint of determining your own fair market value assessment for, for the property. So starting with a, you know, kind of a high level overview, as Greg mentioned, you know, property taxes fall under the broad uh, blanket of ad valorem taxes. And, you know, going back to my high school Latin, that it means according to, to value. And it, it's a broad, you know, broad brush that covers a variety of different types of taxes, things like sales and use taxes, value added taxes, and then obviously property taxes, which is going to be a, a bit more of our focus. You know, you can contrast this to things like income taxes that would, you know, fall under a, a different category. And uh, Joe will touch on some some points uh, related to that here in a little bit. Uh, so if we could flip to the next slide. You know, property taxes have been around for, you know, obviously a very long time. You see there, there's records back to uh, 6,000 years BC. For So for those of us who have gone and tried to appeal our taxes and, you know, gone through the pain of, of those negotiations, you know, you can take some solace in the fact that those conversations have been happening for several thousand years. So you're not the first person to uh, to feel, feel that pain. Um, you know, there's also going way back, there are records all the way back in ancient Egypt of, you know, people trying to register land as being tax exempt due to things like flooding uh, or exemptions for uh, priests or uh, clergy going back to ancient Egypt. So, you know, going back, to, you know, over 2000 years, people have been, you know, as long as there's been property tax, there have been people that have been trying to find a way to not pay property tax. And that goes all the way through to, you know, obviously here in, in America, uh, property taxes have been have been part of the equation since the early days. Uh, you know, given we're 50 states, those you know the the rules around property tax tend to vary quite a bit across states, across municipalities, uh, even school district by school district in some in some states. So uh, quite a bit of uh, variation in in practice across across the country. Um, but, you know, the, the concept remains the same back to the, you know, the very old idea from, you know, 6,000, 6,000 BC. So if we can flip to the, to the next slide, um, you know, most, most local governments in the, in the U.S. will impose some, some sort of property taxes. And, you know, as, as Greg mentioned in the prior section, there are three kind of general categories that we think about when we, we think about these taxes. Uh, it's on real property, uh, business personal property, and in uh, some jurisdictions, intangible properties. And like I mentioned, there's quite a bit of variability by, by state, uh, by county, by local jurisdiction. So, you know, it's uh, an obvious uh, first question to ask when you're talking about the property tax liabilities is where does the property, property reside? 
And you know, another consistent thing that we see in most jurisdictions across across the U.S. is there's you know this concept of the assessor who who sets uh, you know sets the, the value of the property. Um, usually, they have some sort of a a consistent process that they utilize to to set those properties, and in some cases, uh, that gives you a very good answer. In some cases, maybe a, a less good answer, and that's that's where you know performing your own valuation of a property can can be important to make sure that you are paying the appropriate amount of property taxes based on the actual fair market value of of the property. So if we can flip to the next slide, so just to level set some terms. Um, you know, what, what is property? And essentially property is, is everything. It's, you know, it can, like I said, it can be real property, business, personal property. It can also be intangible assets. And it's, it's the bundle of rights that come with the ownership of that property. And in some cases you can specifically acquire real estate, business, personal property, but in some cases you acquire that bundle of rights and it can be it can be difficult to to determine the fair market value of each of those you know each of those pieces uh, of ownership that came with that property. You know, I like to think about it like a bundle of sticks. You know, you have a, a handful of sticks, and trying to figure out each the value of each one of those to separate those to make sure that you're only paying property tax on the pieces that actually are subject to taxation and not paying tax on the pieces that are not subject to taxation. And again, as I said, you know, the three broad, very broad categories that we think about when we think about uh, property taxes and being subject to assessment is real property, uh, generally land buildings, uh, improvements, business personal property, and then intangible, intangible assets. Uh, intangible assets, you know, we see those in a variety of uh, different contexts. Uh, sometimes we see them on a standalone basis. In other cases, we see them potentially embedded within things like business personal property. So those become pretty interesting valuation uh, exercises to try to understand the, you know, how to take the value of those embedded intangible assets and remove them from the either business personal property or, or the real estate. So if we could flip to the, the next slide, um, you know, just to further the point about the diversity in practice, uh, this is a, you know, this map is constantly changing. So I'm sure there's probably at least one state that's uh, maybe flipped color since I put this together, but this gives you a general idea of the diversity in practice. And if you, uh, you know, if you look at the, the green states there, those are the states that only tax business personal property. Uh, so they don't tax inventory. Uh, if you look at the red states, those tax business personal property, but then in addition to that, they'll also tax inventory. Um, and then you see there's a, you know, a couple of states there that have some exemptions. And then those couple of few states that are still colored white have no, no personal property tax. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is all of the states tax real property to, to some extent. So that doesn't enter into the, uh, the color equation here. But the, the takeaway here is that you know, the, the states have quite a bit of diversity in practice. Um, that, you know, as you can see, there's different considerations that need to need to be touched on for based on the type of property and then physically where it's located. So if we could flip to slide 12, um, real property, and you know, I think Greg covered some of this fairly well, but it's you know, it is it is taxable in, in all states. And it's generally will be valued by the, the assessor and the assessor will have some mechanism whereby they come up with a assessed value on a, on a yearly basis. Um, generally for real property, we'll, we'll see a bit of a focus on a, uh, some sort of a market type approach, uh, looking at the values of properties in the, you know, in, with similar characteristics in a similar geographic area, you know, to focus upon the valuation of, of that real property. Flipping over to the next slide on, on personal property. Um, again, as we showed earlier, it's not taxable in all states and it's 
the the I guess difference with personal property that we that we do see is there's different types of personal property uh, inventory, which I mentioned, which is not necessarily taxable in all states. Uh, generally, within this blanket, I will include things like uh, motor vehicles, um, which will have some, you know, generally have some market indicators of value. Um, but we also see for for business personal property we often see assessors take uh, a cost approach to value. So looking at the historical cost and, and applying some sort of a uh, depreciation curve to estimate the fair market value of the property as of the, the appropriate lien date. And then flipping over to intangible property, and this is where it gets a bit more interesting. Um, generally in most states, intangible property is is exempt. And the challenge here, and I think Greg touched on this briefly in his presentation, is is separating the intangibles. And to, to provide a couple of examples, you know, things like embedded software, you know, especially these days, a lot of high tech assets have a fairly significant software component. Um, so obviously the hardware has value, but there's also value associated with that software. If the software is not taxable, trying to, to bifurcate the value between the two of those uh, can be challenging, but it certainly can, can be done. Um, you know, the other, other types of intangibles we see are purchase premiums or goodwill. So we'll see this in the case of a business combination. An assessor may say, well, this business sold for hundred dollars therefore the assessed value of the property is a hundred dollars but there may be a value of the property but the purchaser may have paid a premium to enter that business or some synergy with their business so identifying those those intangible assets and how they're separate from the underlying hard assets is important um, and then as you know we talked about earlier you know looking at things that might be sitting on the fixed asset listing of a company but may not necessarily be taxable. Um, things like asset retirement obligations. You know, those are things that are required to, by the uh, financial reporting rules to be on the books, but don't necessarily meet the definition of business personal property or real property. So identifying those sort of things. And then also regulatory assets or other soft costs that don't meet the definition in the jurisdiction of business personal property or real estate can also be removed. So doing that review uh, at the outset is important to make sure that you're not unnecessarily paying tax on items that would, uh, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't meet the definition of taxation. So if we can flip to the next couple slides, uh, if we can flip to slide 16, I'm gonna touch on the valuation aspects uh, a bit here. And when we think about the valuation uh, from an appraisal standpoint, generally we see assessors will lean on one approach. Uh, they'll say they consider the other two, but in practice, they generally do tend to lean on one approach. And from a, an appraisal standpoint, we, the expectation is that we would have you know, three approaches to value looked at, a cost approach, a sales comparison approach, as well as an income approach. Um, there's other in certain jurisdictions, there are other approaches that are used, things like value equalization and stock and debt approach, but those are sort of the exceptions to the rule. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about those. So going to the next slide. Uh, so cost approach, um, you know, from a valuation perspective, it's generally the, the starting point is looking at a estimate of the replacement or reproduction cost. So that's as of your lien date, what would it cost to buy a new replacement of the asset that I'm trying to value? And then from there, looking at generally three types of obsolescence. One is physical deterioration because of the age or condition of the property. And, and assessors will, are generally pretty good at uh, estimating that. The pieces that we find they generally aren't quite as good at uh, are things like economic obsolescence and functional obsolescence. So these are, when we think about economic obsolescence, these are things like decreased demand that uh, for the product that maybe the machinery and equipment produces would reduce the value of it. Um, other external uh, factors that would drive the value down. And then functional obsolescence is something about the specific asset itself. So an obsolete design, 
uh, some sort of fuel usage or something that has you know create made that asset less desirable in the current current marketplace. So flipping to the next slide. So as I mentioned, the cost approach is, is heavily used for personal property, um, primarily because it's difficult to uh, isolate an income approach for a lot of personal property assets. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of times there aren't good market comparables for uh, you know, very specialized business personal, personal property. And, you know, going through this, like I said, it's, you know, predicated on estimating a you know, cost to replace that asset that can either be done through invoices or um, what we call a trending approach. So looking at the historical cost and looking at cost trends from the time of that purchase to the lien date, um, making sure that you have an included cost that are not meeting the definitions of uh, personal property or, or real estate. And, um, you know, using that to, to come up with your estimate of, of replacement cost as your starting point for the valuation. And just to kind of touch on the, those definitions again, you know, why I was using replacement and reproduction cost interchangeably, but the reproduction cost, the terminology, you'll generally hear that as, or you'll see that as the trending trending method uh, where the historical cost of the asset is trended up to to the lien date using some sort of a third party cost index replacement cost is is generally going out to vendors getting some you know some recent estimate usually engineering or broker based uh, to estimate the the cost of the cost of the asset today and okay so just wrapping up on the, the cost approach, the you know, cost approach is, is generally good for, for new construction where you have recent costs. You know those costs haven't drifted quite a bit since the, uh, the installation of the property. Um, it, it's also very good, for, as I mentioned, for special use property where there's not a lot of secondary market uh, comparables. And uh, many assessors tend to lean on the cost approach. So as part of evaluation, they would wanna see that calculation as it compares to theirs. So generally for property tax, especially for business personal property, uh, a cost approach is, is gonna be uh, an important uh, piece of the, the valuation. There are some challenges to the cost approach. Um, you know, quantifying some of those obsolescence adjustments can be, can be challenging. Um, in certain cases where you have an income generating property, it can be considered less, uh, uh, less reliable than the income approach. And there are several assumptions, uh, like I mentioned, those trends, the depreciation that need to be vetted out in order to, to come up with a, uh, a solid cost approach. You flip to the next slide. Um, you know, again, going through some of those, those assumptions, um, just making some assumptions around physical deterioration or depreciation of the property. Um, for older assets, figuring out what the residual value of those assets are once they've gone beyond their uh, expected useful life. Because if generally the expectation is if the asset is still being used, even if it's beyond its, its expected useful life, there would still be some residual value. And then going through you know, all of the potential types of functional obsolescence and economic obsolescence, uh, things like excess operating costs, excess maintenance costs, um, fuel costs, things like that. So, you know, the, the cost approach is, is going to, you know, generally give you, uh, you know, it, it'll be an important part of your overall analysis, um, particularly for personal property. Um, broadening out, if we want to flip to the next slide. Um, so broadening out to, you know, to cover some of the other, you know, the other asset types, uh, specifically real estate, um, I'm going to touch briefly here on the sales comparison approach, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dave Aguilera to spend a little more time on the income approach. But, you know, the market approach is, is generally um, the, the example I always like to, to give is if you're trying to value your car, you know, there's, if you have a Ford F-150, for example, you know, there are going to be lots of comparable uh, sales in the market. So coming up with those comparable sales to the extent that you need to make adjustments, you know, add for certain features that don't exist on the asset you're trying to value. 
and utilizing that as, as an indicator to value. Uh, one thing to point out, you know, closed transactions or act actual transactions are usually preferable to just purely relying on sales listings because um, sales listings can sometimes have a kind of an optimism premium in them on the part of the seller. And, and again, the, the sales comparison and market approach is, is often used for uh, certain types of, of real estate. And with that, I'll segue over to Dave and he'll talk a little more about the income approach and a couple of other topics in property tax. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Um, we'll spend a few minutes here just discussing the income approach, and then I'm going to touch on just some of the sort of recent trends that we're seeing in, in overall valuation, um, specifically related to the pandemic and the recovery and, and how kind of values looked um, mainly at year end, right? At 1231, 20, that's when a lot of the uh, assessments uh, were updated. And at that point in time, sort of what the markets looked like and, and how they could impact your assessment and your values uh, for 2021. So continuing on just valuation approaches, um, the, the third approach is the income approach. And really, uh, you know, I like to consider this uh, sort of the most uh, superior approach if you're able to develop it. And certainly for real estate that is capable of producing income um, and, and you know that that is usually uh, applicable to almost all property types with the exception of very specialized owner user properties but if you think of a property and you're able to generate income via rent as if you're the landlord then you can develop an income approach for the property um, and, and so there's sort of two forms of the income approach one is called direct capitalization and the other is a discounted cash flow uh, direct cap it is more of a simplified approach, um, you know, for, for more of a sort of single tenant, maybe two tenant type buildings where there's not a lot of volatility, not a lot of changes in net operating income. Um, it's used a lot in multifamily or, or single tenant industrial types of buildings where you kind of know what your net operating income is annualized. It's not going to change a lot year over year. And, and then the, the real, um, sort of quandary is trying to determine what an appropriate capitalization rate would be. And a capitalization rate is essentially, it, it's a ratio. Uh, it's kind of the inverse uh, of a multiple, um, but uh, you know, in, in, in real easy terms, it's a uh, net operating income divided by a capitalization rate gives you an indication of the fair value of the property. Um, and cap rates will vary by property type, by location and, and by, a sort of the performance of the property. Um, so, you know, if a, if a property is uh, underperforming or there's some issues with occupancy or demand, it could warrant a higher cap rate than the market. Um, so there's an analysis that needs to be done to, to determine the correct capitalization rate. Discounted cash flow is most applicable for more complex types of assets. So think about um, multi-tenant office buildings, your shopping malls, um, retail centers, uh, where there's a lot of fluctuation in income and expenses over time as tenants move in and out of properties. Um, so that's usually done over a projection or holding period, uh, can vary in, in terms of length, um, but you know the standard kind of in the appraisal industry is usually a 10 year holding period. And you project a sale price at the end of year 10 and then you discount all of the cash flows um, in addition to the, the future sale price to a net present value to arrive at, at the fair value of the property. The nice thing about the income approach is it in, in, encompasses all forms of physical deterioration and functional obsolescence. So whereas Matt, um, or I'm sorry, Patrick just described sort of obsolescence that would need to be deducted from a cost approach or external obsolescence that would need to be adjusted for in your, your comparables when you're doing a market or sales comparison approach. The income approach kind of takes that all into a, to effect because it's reflected in the income capabilities, uh, income generation capabilities of the property and reflected in the rent or certainly in the discount rate. So let's move forward. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of slides here that talk about generation of property, and this is really income generation, or, or you know, if you've got more of a personal property type of asset, this would be power generation in the, in the um, oil and gas or, or power fields. But um, for the most part, if you, like I mentioned, if you're able to generate income from the property, you can develop the income approach 
you need to understand what the income is, the historical income and the future income of the property. And that's going to be generally through the form of rent. So what's market rent for the property and what are your tenants currently paying? Uh, and then make sure you're factoring in all of your expenses. And again, th this slide's somewhat um, specific to, to power generation, but for, for typical real estate, your expenses are, um, you know, your property taxes, your insurance, and, and all of the operating expenses associated with operating the, the property. Some of them can be passed through to the tenants, others will be incurred by the landlord. So it's important to understand the expense structure for each of your leases. Moving along, um, again, you want to try to get to a, 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 a sort of a normalized income and expense, especially if you're doing a direct capitalization approach. So you want to remove sort of any one time um, income or expense features that really wouldn't be applicable into the future. There is when, when you're doing discounted cash flow, you do have to make sure you you take into a, a account any sort of uh, one-time expenses for the up, upkeep of the property. Usually that's um, incorporated in some tor sort of replacement for reserves. But if you know you have to replace a roof or an HVAC unit or something along the way during your, your cash flow holding period, you should include that as an expense. All right, moving along, please. Um, and then just direct capitalization. Like I mentioned, this is the, the more simplistic form of the income approach. Um, you know, the one the one caveat that I, I talk to or I, you know, I, I tend to consult with with folks about the direct capitalization approach is it, you really don't want to develop it if you've got more than a few tenants in place. If there's a lot of fluctuation with your income, if there's some fluctuation with occupancy in the property, you really should be looking at this over a holding period and not a, a direct cap approach. I, I often see where folks say, okay, I've got an office building, it's only 50% occupied, and we're just going to cap the 50% occupancy. Uh, that's going to come up, that's going to lead to a value that's understated because you're not, you're, you're not sort of ascribing any value for the other 50% of the building. Um, whereas if in a discounted cash flow, you will lease up that space over time, uh, as long as there's demand for it. Okay. Just DCF again, you know, the superior approach uh, and certainly the most applicable approach for most property types that, uh, you know, generate income over time. Again, lots of different leases. We also often use a software system called Argus to track all of the, the income and expenses for the property. It'll have all of the lease details, so start dates, end dates, um, lease escalations over time. Uh, that's a very helpful tool when developing a discounted cash flow. Um, and then, you know, similar to the direct capitalization approach, you're going to do some research into the market. So make sure you understand supply and demand, and then also understand sort of what the required return would be from a, um, uh, a discount rate perspective. So you can apply the, the right discount rate. And that's often uh, obtained from investor sentiment in, in what folks are, are currently pricing deals. So trying to understand certain transactions over time, what the, the capitalization rates were implied within those transactions, and then what the required return are for investors in that market that'll help you select the discount rate that is most appropriate for the property. Um, again, we kind of just talked about this just with, with cap rates, um, loaded versus unloaded cap rates. I think you need to understand if you are um, appealing your assessment and you expect to play, pay lower tax in the future, there's sort of two ways to, to do that in an income approach. You can reflect what you think your future property tax would be, or you can adjust your capitalization rate to reflect that if you've got sales um, of properties that were fully loaded and the capitalization rates being extracted from those sales, you might need to make an adjustment to your capitalization rate uh, to, to ensure you're coming up with the correct fair value of the property. Um, I think we really already touched upon the sales comparison approach, but I think this slide is really getting at it is how do we extract a capitalization rate from a sale? Uh, and that's really the, the, the best way to to obtain um, a cap rate from uh, from the market. There are investor surveys that a lot of folks will, will utilize. PwC has a survey that gets put, um, published every quarter. Uh, RERC has another one, Real Capital Analytics um, has another. So folks will, will utilize them to sort of get a feel for what capitalization rates are in the market. But really the best way to, to try to understand a cap rate is to, to look at transactions in the market. And if you have the op operating income 
and the sale price, you can calculate the capitalization rate. Um, so that really gives you a really good feel for what should be the capitalization rate for, for your property. Now you'll need to make adjustments if you have things that are impacting your property that are different from your comparable sales uh, and you can make those adjustments. Um, and, and then just the last slide here and just on valuation is just the equalization of value. And this is really kind of basic, but um, I think everybody realizes when they're paying their property taxes that the, the assessment also often is not uh, what the, uh, the local taxing jur jurisdictions believes is the fair value. There are certain jurisdictions where fair value and, and assessed value are equal to one another, but, but generally the assessed value is set at some ratio of fair value. So just sort of a caveat to make sure when you're looking at your uh, property taxes that you're not uh, sort of blindly thinking that the assessed value is fair value and you're making the appropriate adjustments to understand what the equalization rate is in that municipality. All right, we're gonna spend, I, I know I'm up against the clock here, I'm spending just a couple minutes here talking about COVID-19 and how that impacted property values. And this is sort of evolving almost uh, every day. It changes a little bit, certainly as we emerge from the pandemic. I, I think the, the sentiment among the appraisal community is things have changed a lot more, uh, a lot rapidly, a lot more rapidly over the last few weeks than probably anybody anticipated. If you if you went back in time into to March and April, I don't think we thought the reopening would happen quite as, as quickly uh, as it has. And certainly if you fast, if you go back to where we were at year end 2020, like I alluded to earlier, uh, the sediment still there, there was, you know, it, we were, it was unknown as to when the vaccine would be rolled out, how quickly we could get it into people's arms and, and how quickly that would impact the reopening. So there was uh, certainly certain property types that were being impacted by COVID-19 last year. Uh, they still will be this year. I mean, if you think about hospitality and hotels and retail, I mean, the, the recovery is, is, is happening, but it is certainly is going to be a slow crawl for certain property types. Uh, so moving along, we'll just talk about um, the large, like I mentioned, largest impact uh, was certainly lodging, senior housing and retail, senior housing for, for the obvious reasons of, uh, you know, just they were hit extremely hard at the onset of the pandemic and there's some reluctance in the market uh, and occupancy is pretty low and, and there's now a host of additional expenses that are required in senior housing that are that's impacting net operating income. Um, Office and student housing, interesting. I mean, I think office is one that, that people are still speculating around what exactly is gonna happen as folks work from home. Is there gonna be uh, less need for, for typical office space? I think we all know that the answer is probably yes. We just don't know how, how to quantify that yet. So the general sentiment is I think that office space will experience some, some vacancy and, and certainly some loss in, in market rent. Uh, but often office leases are locked in for longer periods of time. So three, five or 10 year leases. So they haven't been impacted as greatly right now, but they will over, over time. And then multifamily and industrial really did pretty well during the pandemic. Uh, you know, there was a thought at the beginning that multifamily would struggle as people weren't able to pay rent, but it, it really didn't happen. And then industrial with, with the demand for online goods, uh, industrial really actually was a, a bright spot for the real estate community. Okay, um, just touching on a little bit more and we'll quickly move through these so we can get to the next segment, but happy to take questions on these, but um, retail, office, and industrial, uh, again, when, when you're valuing these things, you really have to understand your cash flow and, and what the tenants, uh, what the makeup of your tenants are, you know, wh which ones are going to stay there, which ones are able to pay rent, which ones are downsizing, moving out, um, and, and so Again, this would be a discounted cash flow scenario where you're trying to understand how long a tenant will be in place, what happens at the end of their lease, what market rent would look like if they do extend or if they leave, how long will it take to find a new tenant? Uh, I mean, all those things need to be incorporated into your discounted cash flow scenario for, for those types of properties. Hospitality, again, you know, I did a lot of valuations for hotels back in the fall. And at the, that time, uh, again, no, nobody knew uh, just how quickly the uh, vaccines would be available. And the thought was there was going to be a really long time for a recovery for hotels. We were speculating between three and five years uh, back in the fall where it would take for folks to get back to 
net operating income equal to 2019. Now, I think that's changing pretty quickly. Um, you know, I'm currently staying in a hotel in Hartford and the parking lot was full last night. So people are back out again, traveling. I think the the more sort of tourist destinations and, and vacation spots have certainly recovered much quicker and, and they're is seeing really high demand and low vacancies, certainly during the summertime. Some of the more business travel type spots, I think will take a little bit longer to recover. But my guess is right now, uh, I think folks are thinking that that those properties probably won't take three to five years to recover. They're gonna be recovering a little bit quicker. But again, if you are appealing taxes as of 12, 31, 20, it's what was known or knowable at that point in time. So you have to kind of put yourself uh, under the lens of, of what you would do as if you were writing the report and, and determining fair value at that point in time. And like I said, everything published back then was sort of a long recovery process. Certain, certain property types would really be impacted uh, for a long period of time. And, and again, as somebody that does a lot of work in hospitality, international hotels, um, you, you know, in, in certain spots were really going to be struggling as as travel was predicted to be pretty low again all that has changed a lot over the last couple months all right and then senior housing again i already touched on this briefly um i don't know if this is pertinent to this group or not but I, again just the increased expenses and then the stigma associated with, with senior housing has, has caused those properties to struggle uh certainly much greater again and probably 12 months ago uh, to, to nine months ago, I think they're recovering a little bit better now. And they're, that, you know, now that everybody is vaccinated, it, it's not as big of a concern, but certainly increased expenses uh, going forward. Student housing is an interesting one. I think the thought was at the beginning of the pandemic, as all the students were, were going virtual, a lot, a lot more folks would, would be kind of taking classes from home. Uh, I think what we found out is uh, Students don't like to, to be at home and their parents are, are happy to pay the rent and, and get them out of the house. So even though uh, they weren't taking classes sort of in the, the typical brick and mortar classroom setting, they were still renting multifamily um, student housing buildings and, and taking their classes from their, their apartments. Uh, so uh, again, there was some thought that that would be impacted and some properties will be impacted with, uh, with a decreased occupancy. But for the most part, I think student housing has held, uh, held its own and they're looking pretty strong going into to next year as most uh, almost all colleges are, are planning to be fully open uh, at the start of the fall semester. Um, it, 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 we'll touch on this quickly. I mean, it, just a, a few things to consider um, when, when valuing things for COVID-19 and it really gets into each individual property is going to be different. Every assumption has to be looked at. Each tenant needs to be on a, a, a deep analysis. So it's not just, hey, what was NOI last year? Let's increase it a little bit this year and, and you know, expenses will go up 3% and, you know, we'll carry it forward in our cash flow. A, a deep analysis needs needs to be done to, to understand the impact of COVID-19 to your cash flows and, and ultimately to your fair value. Uh, again, the, you guys can read this uh, after the fact, but a, a couple, a, a number of bullets here uh, related to the, the asset type, the occupancy, quality of the tenants, the credit loss, the rent concessions, uh, tenant improvement allowances. You know, if you're giving out big TIs as the landlord to get occupancy in your building, how does that impact your cash flow? Uh, so on and so forth. And that's really it. So I, I flew through those as quickly as possible for you, Joe. So uh, happy to take any questions at the end of this, but I'll, I'll move it, uh, I'll, I'll transition on to, to Joe and Matt. Hey, thanks. And, and Patrick, thanks as well. That was, that was good stuff. Um, we've got about uh, 15 minutes left and we have just a few updates we want to touch on. Now, these are not necessarily property tax issues, uh, but uh, income tax issues around property. <laughs> so I um, wanted to give a little bit of a technical update around some new rules, some that came um, around the CARES Act, um, some that were started with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017, and a couple that even earlier, but the things to think through, particular, particularly as you're valuing property um, and as you're considering, um, well, you know, if I have some adverse property tax ramifications, perhaps there's some offsetting beneficial income tax ramifications. So I'll turn it over to Matt to um, go through a few of these uh, to start. Sure. Thanks, Joe. So I think we'll start here with qualified improvement property. Um, this is more or less at the end of the day, sort of a, an asset class or category that's been around for a number of years. Um, previously, it was known as qualified leasehold improvement property, but this came about um, 
the name change came about the qualified uh, improvement property as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, back in 2017. Um, what is QIP and why isn't it important here? Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, this is a specialized asset class that is eligible for a shorter recovery period uh, for federal income tax purposes. It's also bonus eligible. Um, so otherwise, you know, to the extent that building property that's otherwise lumped into sort of non-residential real properties is, is, is um, capitalized and depreciated over 39 years, not bonus eligible. QIP is typically um, depreciated over a shorter recovery period, 15 years under GDS, 20 years for ADS, and it is bonus eligible. Um, so what constitutes qualified improvement property? Typically, it's any sort of improvement that's made to the interior of a building um, that does not constitute, um, you know, an expansion um, or a building addition. And there's also a, a few specific um, exclusions as well. So um, anything that would be related to the building's internal structural framework would not qualify as qualified improvement property. Um, anything related to elevators and escalators as well would sort of fall under that same sort of category or bucket. Um, and as such would be, would be excluded from QIP. Now, why are we ultimately talking about QIP today? Um, at the end of the day, as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, QIP was defined in the regulations um, as, a, um, as an asset type, but ultimately it was excluded from the portion of the code that, that provides for that shorter recovery period and, and bonus depreciation. As a result, we ultimately were waiting for a technical correction in order to update um, and provide for that shorter useful life um, and bonus eligibility for QIP eligible assets um, that were placed in service after 2017. Um, this didn't come about until the release of the CARES Act in early 2020, which ultimately provided for that change. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, this really impacted taxpayers who did place in service QIP in tax years 2018, 2019, were subsequently required to capitalize and depreciate those assets over a 39 year recovery period um, for GDS, 40 years for ADS, um, and ultimately were not required or not eligible to claim bonus depreciation on that property. Now, as a result of the CARES Act change, the change was actually made retroactively. And so taxpayers that had previously been treating QIP as 39 years or 40 years, um, property are currently not in compliance in those 2018, 2019 um, tax periods. And so absence any special guidance or transition relief from the um, IRS, you know, this really puts taxpayers in a hard position in terms of adopting um, or making this change on a, on, a, on a retroactive basis. Luckily for taxpayers, there was specialized guidance and transition relief that came about um, in this past year as a result of uh, Rev Proc 2020-25. So ultimately at the end of the day, you know, taxpayers have two procedural choices that they can make in terms of um, addressing this QIP property that was um, you know, subsequently depreciated using an incorrect useful life of 39 years. You can either go back and amend your returns for those prior years, which can be filed by the end of um, uh, October 15th, 2021 of this current year, or the typically the more the easier approach is to just file a form 3115, which is also provided through um, this ref proc as well. Um, the IRS basically grants automatic consent um, using this DCN, this change number 244. Um, there are streamlined filing procedures that make it a little bit easier for taxpayers at the end of the day to file this method change. And there's also a waiver of scope restrictions um, related to the method change as well. One other helpful area to point out in terms of RefProc 2020-25 Surprisingly, it also relates or provides um, uh, retroactive elections related to bonus depreciation, as well as the use of ADS rather than GDS um, for all classes of property, not just QIP um, classes of property. And so, you know, this kind of opens up a little bit of a tax planning play um, for, for clients and, and taxpayers here in terms of, you know, it's opening up eligibility to um, basically elect out or, or make the election um, for bonus depreciation in um, 2018, 2019 for, for classes of property that otherwise um, either were not eligible because QIP wasn't included in the specialized um, rules 
or um, perhaps the taxpayer has changed their position in terms of how they'd like to depreciate that, that property that was placed in service in those years that falls outside of QIP. Um, so typically these changes are made through a Form 3115 application for, for change in, in tax accounting method. Um, and again, these need to be filed by the end of um, October 15th, 2021. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, that's all kind of important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the challenge of leasehold improvements with property tax um, to the extent that you have uh, some adverse property tax ramifications there. There may also be some pretty significant income tax, at least timing, um, deductions available to you as you're combing through your property list and understanding what's what. Um, the depreciation rules, we don't want to get too into the weeds, but look, we, we have another round of tax reform headed our way, uh, probably in the next few months, the hallmark of which is very likely to be an increase in the corporate tax rate. So um, you may want to consider delaying some of those expenses until a higher rate period. Uh, but in any event, um, there's a significant amount of income tax work, and we'll go through a few other items um, as, you're, as you're sort of working through your, your property ledger. So the next technical update that we wanted to quickly cover is just related to bonus depreciation. Obviously, this has been around for a number of years as well. Um, recently, the final regulations were actually um, reviewed and approved, and so those are actually in place on a go-forward basis. And so I just wanted to cover um, bonus expensing um, briefly with the group. Um, currently, for any property that's acquired and placed in service after September 27th, 2017 through the end of tax year 2022 is eligible for 100% um, bonus for any qualified property types. Um, after 2022, this 100% this bonus amount ultimately um, is phased down in 20% increments through 2026. Um, there is sort of a short period that taxpayers need to be aware of as well. Um, for any property that was acquired before that date, so before September 28th, 2017, and placed in service before um, the end of the year or subsequently in 2018, 2019, there is a reduced um, bonus eligible percentage that would be applied of 50% um, for that qualified property that then phases down to in 10% increments in 2018 and 2019. So this slide again just talks about the phase down of the um, the bonus percentage um, starting in 2023. I think one thing that we did want to point out here was that this could be subject to change, um, you know, especially with um, the Biden administration taking over. Um, you know, there there certainly could be um, changes to this phase down, um, you know, percentage starting in 2023. So definitely something to to, to keep an eye out for in the coming years as well. And then we also have a specific um, call out again of that RevProc 2020-25 as a result of the CARES Act that ultimately allows taxpayers, if they so choose to um, you know, basically modify or revoke or amend their election um, regarding bonus depreciation for all assets of um, all asset classes um, for assets that were placed in service in 2018 and 2019 as well, to the extent that you know, you again file that third form 3115 by the by um uh, October 15th of, of this year. In terms of the types of property that is ultimately eligible um, for bonus depreciation, this there really hasn't been too much in terms of changes here, except for one um, specific item that we wanted to call out. Um, and this relates to, um, uh, whereas historically, you know, bonus depreciation was only eligible for first time use property um, by any taxpayer. It has now changed to first time use by the specific taxpayer that has acquired the property. And so to the extent that you have acquired any used property, you can in fact take um, bonus depreciation on that property as well on a go forward basis. Um, one specific example of an item that wouldn't fall under this would be, you know, if you had at least, let's say an asset um, from a third party and then subsequently um, acquired that, that property from that party, that would fall outside of the, the first time use rules and ultimately you wouldn't be able to claim bonus depreciation on that, on that specific asset. And so for the next section here, we just briefly wanted to, to cover cost segregation and, and fixed assets review, which is a service that we provide um, a number of our clients and you know, I believe Greg and, and both Patrick and Ian Greg had, had touched upon this um, earlier in the presentation. 
um, alluding to the fact that, you know, to the extent that you can basically um, comb through any of that non-residential uh, real property that's currently depreciated over a 39 year um, recovery period, to the extent that you can segregate out those costs to tangible personal property or some other asset class that's recovered over a shorter, shorter um, useful life, um, that ultimately results in you know potentially increased tax flow for you as a taxpayer um, as a result of deferring those taxes to a to a, a future tax year. Um, certainly, there's a number of techniques that we can um, employ in order to do this. Um, you know. It, it, it's not dependent on whether or not, you know, you have, um, you know, paper detail as to whether or not um, uh, costs are attributed to certain types of, um, you know, personal property within the building itself. Um, we can certainly use cost estimation type techniques. Um, if you have a large number of assets, um, the IRS does accept statistical sampling as well in this area. Um, so there's certainly ways to get around, you know, if you don't have necessarily the documentation to support um, you know, the cost that should be attributed to certain um, or individual pieces of property within a building itself. Um, what are typically the triggers for a cost segregation or fixed assets review? Um, typically, if you've recently constructed a new facility, um, recently acquired a new facility, or if you've gone through major renovations or re remodeling of your current uh, facilities, um, those are typically, you know, helpful fact patterns where, you know, we've seen taxpayers in the past, just due to the fact that it's, you know, relatively easy um, to basically bucket, you know, a substantial amount of cost to just 39 year non residential real property, whereas there might be an opportunity to segregate out some of those costs to, to tangible personal property or expense it currently. Yeah, and, and you know, that's, that's always a, a good income tax answer as well, because again, we get bonus depreciation, short recovery period. Um, but again, if you're in a jurisdiction where perhaps we have a real property tax and not a personal property tax or a higher real property tax versus personal property. There's there's ancillary benefits to carving out that personal property from your structure. Um, you know, so so it's a it's a good approach all around. Matt, we've only got a few more minutes, so I think maybe we skip to the last section. There's a few slides in here that you can look through around depreciation and uh, differences between real personal property and some of the key issues in cost sake. But we wanted to touch just very briefly on the tangible property regulations that are, are now, um, you know, nearly seven or eight years old, but also very important to this discussion. Uh, the tangible property race came out in 2014 to support um, some really sort of murky areas of fixed fixed asset accounting, um, particularly related to repairs and improvements. Uh, they're often referred to as the repair regs. Uh, you may have dealt with them uh, at the time. It also talked about acquisitions and dispositions of certain property. Um, on the next slide, Matt, the hallmark of the regs was the discussion around repair versus improvement. So, for example, um, if I have a hole in my roof, have I repaired my building or have I put on a new roof? Um, those have uh, different conclusions, could change the valuation of your property, uh, certainly could change the treatment of the expenses incurred um, in order to fix that hole in your roof. But what the rules came out with is that we first have to identify what our unit of property is. Um, typically speaking, there's a there's a sort of a functional interdependence rule for personal property. Uh, for real property, it's based off of building systems. So if you have a plumbing system, an electrical system, um, and uh, or or the structure itself, and then what we do is apply certain capitalization standards to understand whether or not we've had a betterment, an adaptation, or a restoration of our unit of property. Uh, it's not always clear. Uh, these rules certainly made it a little bit clearer than than whatever guidance we had used in the past. Um, <clears throat> but it allowed us to uh, apply an approach to certain expenses incurred on a, on a, on a typical basis. Um, there were some exceptions put in place that were also very helpful. Particularly, there's a book conformity election that allows us to follow our financial statement treatment for repairs, which may or may not be the right answer from either an income or a property tax perspective. And there's also a routine maintenance safe harbor that says, you know, if it's, if it's something that will be um, incurred in order to keep a piece of property up to its normal use, um, that happens more than twice during its ADS life, or at least twice during its ADS class life, um, then we can treat it as, as a deductible expense and not something that should otherwise be capitalized to the basis of the property, thus perhaps in increasing the valuation and certainly delaying the expense for income tax purposes. Um, Matt, if we can move to the next slide. Again, this is just a brief graphic on how we determine our unit of property as we're applying those rules, uh, determining that cost that we um, 
um, we, uh, we incur, whether or not we've improved or repaired our property. Um, I think that covers the majority of it, Matt, if you want to just skip through. This is a little bit of a graphical depiction of the unit and property for buildings and how there's separate building systems that we have to apply these betterment uh, adaptation or restoration rules to. Uh, so for example, you may find that if you have a building um, and there's one bathroom and we got the plumbing of that one bathroom, we may have made a material betterment to the plumbing system, which might be capital. Now, if we do that same thing in a 50 uh, story skyscraper, uh, and you know, we certainly, by, by gutting one bathroom, we haven't made a material impact to the overall plumbing system. So the same activity could achieve a, a different result depending on what we're talking about uh, under these rules. Um, Let's just keep moving on, Matt. I think we probably covered, <laughs> this is just a little bit of a, a graphic around how you apply the betterment adaptation and restoration standard. You know, what are some things you wanna to look to to see whether we have a better uh, a betterment, whether we have a new or different use for the property or whether we've restored it from a dilapidated state. Um, all of those would generally require capitalization. Uh, a little bit on the routine maintenance safe harbor, but I think we are right at our time. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank everybody for your time. Of course, we're. Uh, we are very happy to uh, be here with you today to talk through some of these issues. Um, Eric, I think if I turn it over to you to wrap up, and <laughs> I suppose we don't have much time, we didn't leave much time for Q&A, um, but hopefully uh, everyone found the, the content useful. So thank you all. Great job. And, and Joe, David, Patrick, Matt, and Greg, uh, many thanks for your time and insights today. We really appreciate the expertise all of you brought to today's session and your company's continued involvement and engagement with CBIA as member companies. And just as a reminder that the Connecticut General Assembly will meet in special session today and tomorrow to act on the technical bills that implement the policies outlined in the state budget that was approved last week. Those implementer bills often create opportunities for legislative mischief, and that's certainly the case this year as we are reviewing it. Uh, CBIA will be following the special session closely and will provide further updates at CBIA.com and through our member newsletters. Thank you for attending today's tax conference. As always, don't hesitate to reach out to me or any CBIA team member with your questions or if you need information on any policy or compliance topic. And most importantly, everyone please enjoy their summer.